What's up, people? You're listening to the Two Pro One Slow podcast, brought to you by Factory Image Racing. Check them out on Instagram at Factory Image Racing. They offer a huge range of hard parts, service parts, tools, and more. Welcome back to episode 12. Um, we are joined by a bit of royalty here, aren't we? Yeah. I'm quite looking forward to this one. We've been trying to set it up for a few months now. But he's been busy and now we've got Wob to come into the studio and film a uh, film podcast, talk about all things Wob, really. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's anyone in the sport that's done so many different different things i mean i'll learn as much as anyone else whilst um whilst we go through it and talk about it but yeah so for those of you listening and not watching we've got doc wob here with us we've also got two pretty special bikes behind us one being tommy's 250 uh, cr250 and one being a chesterfield yam is that right wob yeah it's one of the ones we built for brownie that he raced good man if you just pop that mic a little bit closer so we can hear you so then um well i guess we, we better do a one quick well done, because you are now the British champion. You won that. Yeah, I managed to wrap that up, so that was nice. Congratulations on that, kid. I'm Thank sure, you. I'm sure the big cheese is happy with that one. Yeah, no, uh, Dave was happy. Took the pressure right off, I'm sure. Yeah, it has. Took the pressure off me for the winter, that. <laughs> um, yeah, so right, I reckon we'll just jump straight in. Um, I put some questions out on the 2 Pro 1 slow page, um, but what we should do to start with is, I reckon, just give us a bit of a backstory, Wob. I mean, you've done it all, so tell us where it all began. I've done a bit, but started off as a kid. I didn't know where it come from. I was into dirt bikes. A friend of mine had one, and my dad was into rugby. He's a school teacher. My mum, not at all. So I don't know where it come from. I couldn't, I'm not sounding bleating like, oh, you know, I had it rough, but I didn't have a bike until I could buy myself one when I was 17. And then started racing AMCA, ended up going practicing with Rob Andrews once or twice and realised, I ain't very good at this. <laughs> and it's just depressing when you just see, you think, oh, I'll follow him for a couple of... No, nah, you weren't doing that. <laughs> and then I think, well, maybe I'll be a mechanic. So then you're looking for opportunities. Rob didn't need anybody at the time, and I ended up helping Merv um, and Steve because at the time, a lot of the guys were doing... Well, the, the, the done thing was French internationals, and the rider would go and do a French international on like a Tuesday or some middle of the week day, and the mechanic was at home, so they needed somebody to go with them and just put fuel in, really. So I started doing that. That gave you a tester. What sort of age would you have been there? 20. So you'd started riding 20, what, well, like younger? 17, 17. rode AMCA, junior, seniors, got in the experts, stopped enjoying it the minute I got in the experts and just getting my ass handed to me every week. <laughs> it just stopped being fun. And then I wasn't spending the money on the right things. I had nobody telling me what to do. I was having my helmet painted and some fancy boot gaiters, but I never had a new back tyre. So What's boot gaiters? Oh, they were called in the 80s. <laughs> Boot gaiters, is that like a shin pad thing or something? No, it's like, a, it's like a sleeve that went over your boots that continued the pattern of the jeans down. Oh, really? Oh. They were cool. Like a sticker kit, before sticker kits were a thing. <laughs> yeah, but they were goofy looking, but that's what it was called at the time. Yeah. So. But I never had a tyre, so I never understood why I'd always have a result when it was hard pack. I hated the hard pack, because I had the same grip as everybody else. Oh, what, you didn't even put... You was just... I didn't, in my whole career, I never had a new tyre. I was three years, never had a tyre. Really? Yeah, just, I didn't know any better. And now I've got a few of them, so it's kind of weird. Yeah, now, so that I remember you have told me before, Merv announced there was, Merv was the first guy you worked for. Yeah, Merv always, there was a lot of people who started with Merv because he, he wasn't, he was hard work at the time. He's all right now. Well, he used he, to make his way through mechanics. Oh, yeah, he didn't have many people on. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, he was, uh, they used, he used to not abuse them, but he wasn't, he was hard work. But he was all right with me, and I was there a couple of years on and off. Um, but I know a lot of guys who started with Merv. Because he would get through guys, you know? Yeah. And then we were at the factory. I was helping him in the factory. And a guy called Jim Lewis, who's now in America, he was Watson's mechanic. and he kind of Dave took, Watson? Yeah. And he kind of took me under his wing and fuck, he showed me a lot. And I didn't know what I was doing, but he, he was cool. And when you were at the KTM factory back in the day, you used to be walking up and down the production lines. You could wander into R&D. You could just help yourself, really. Was, it was crazy. Was it... Still the same place it is now, Matterhorn. It's the same town. I don't think it's the same building. Oh, I haven't yeah. been recently, but it's when you were there before, you would like just park up, and like we used to go through the bins at the back of R and D. Nobody cared. It was just. I think it's, it's all changed. Isn't it? I mean, even when you used to ride factory oh. KTM, you used to just get parts galore. The first time I rode from, we used to get so many parts, and then the second time I rode, completely different story. I think now it's um, 
bit different. Yeah, I mean, like we used to go, you know, know, back in the 80s, we had these carnets, which I think you're back on now, and you had to list everything that you took with you and list everything you took back. And like, I swear to God, if one of those customs guys opened that van, it killed him. We just, we were, it was to the roof of the yeah. van. There was so <laughs> much stuff. Nice. So, so after after Merv, then it was? After Merv, then it was uh, Rob Andrews in 88. I worked with him a little bit when he got let go from the popper team. And it was, we were on the back foot, in fairness. We had a couple of practice bikes and just trying to make it through. Still uh, GPs? GPs, yeah. And then Mark Banks, Justin Banks I worked for, ended up going to Paris Supercross with Mark and worked there for a little while. Um, and then in 89, started work with Paul Eddy, doing doing some stuff with him. He was easy life. At the same time, I started a shop in Worcester, which lasted two or three years. And then... Um, in that time, we sponsored Justin Morris and Kawasaki paid me to go to the Grand Prix with him to help him through qualification and all those bits and pieces because yeah. he was a young kid, didn't know what he was doing. Well, I didn't know either, in fairness, but we were, <laughs> I was supposed to be the voice of reason. So there's some funny stories with me and Boris driving around Europe. And then um, the shop got burgled like four times in a year and I got, got sick and tired of it. And then went to the States in 93 for the first time. So I thought, oh. With Eddie? No, no, no. They, I just... I got in touch with a guy who was importing Technocell seats and he got me set up with a private called Gene Numack in Florida and I just got on a plane with a toolbox and went going. Oh, so mechanic for, that was the start of how you got into bikes. Yeah, I mean, that was, I was into it five years in at that point, you know, so I kind of got the hang of it, it was all right. But, you know, going there was a different league, you know, that was the year McGrath was number 15 and just winning everything and you walk in there and it's like, even though you've done Grand Prix, it's still a big deal to walk into them stadiums. And why, how comes it was your thing to go to America as well, a mechanic? You just wanted to go there. Same as a rider. Yeah. Same thing. It's all about the States. And I think as a career, unless you've been and done that, you haven't feel like you've done everything. Yeah. You no, can, I know what you're saying. You know, so you, you need to go and do that. I mean, it was great doing the Grand Prix. When I did the Grand Prix with Merv and with Rob and that, it's a good, it's different, I think, now. I don't yeah, know. I think it's more... Ollie Stone's done it, hasn't he? He's um, a mechanic now yeah, for the yeah. PC race team. Oh, he's just left. He's oh, has he? Now Barsha's mechanic. Yeah, I see that. Oh, yeah, we'll see. He started well, here. I don't and know then if that's been announced yet. Exclusive. No, I, read it somewhere. <laughs> I, know he, I know he's left. Uh, oh. he's, he's gone to work for Barsha. So that's good for him. He's done really well. I'm really proud of Ollie. He's done a massive yeah, it's He's nice. done a mint job there. I remember when he left? Yeah. Like a similar sort of. Well, uh, probably a similar career path to what you had, I guess. Yeah, basically. He was, on, he he was asking me about helping him get a job and this and that. And, you know. He spoke to Mitch at the Nations in Lommel that one year. and Just up and went, didn't he? Yeah, Mitch asked me about him. I said, he's a good kid. I helped him get his work visa by doing some paperwork for him. And uh, that was always an issue when you're over there with visas and whatever, you know. People don't help you, do they? No, you don't realise. Like, when an American comes here... Everyone they, runs around after They him. get picked up from the airport. Here's your car. This is where you're staying. There's food in the fridge. They get everything. When you go over there and you get off the plane, you're like, you've got nothing. No, literally... Uh, it was I saying that when I went, it was quite people helped me, but I know stories from mechanics. And even when Jamie Dobb went over there, he was like, I flew out and then I didn't have any money. And Mitch was like, Well, that's not my problem, mate. You find somewhere to stay and get 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 to the track, and I'll supply a bike. But if you can't get to the track, then that's, there's no you you won't be riding it. Exactly. They're not. They don't look after you like they we did when the Americans come here. It's just not the same deal. But you know, they're not a they're not a flat rental company they no that's what, the motor yeah, race, race team teams. and they also show up and do that but do you think there's a better opportunity as a mechanic or even in the industry in america than there is here i think there's a lot more opportunities now than there was when i was trying to break into it when i was trying to get into it there would be like eight factory mechanics jobs and those dudes just didn't leave yeah unless somebody died saying, yeah. there was not the opportunities and the it was factory or privateer nothing in between and now you've got so many teams like yeah, I guess they're running so more many riders employees. as well. And now as a rider, they'll have practice mechanics. They'll yeah. have all these other opportunities to get into it. I think it's a mint time to get into it. Yeah, I do. For for as what you as you were saying, then the rider would have a mechanic. Even say in Europe, uh, when you're flying around with uh, Justin or driving around with Justin, you're his mechanic. You do his engine. You do his suspension. You do everything. You drive with him. Now you've got truck driver. You have engine guy. You have suspension guy. You yeah, there's have. 15 people. Easy. Yeah, I kind of caught the end of that in when I was factory Suzuki with Raynard in 98 because I was in a box van. And once you're in a box van, you have to organise. You've still got your suspension done for you. You did. But you just have to 
you get a hotel list where you're going to be at what days so you're getting parts shipped to your hotel you're building your bikes you i do my own engines my own everything build the truck organize the parts wash the truck get the groceries you have to do everything now i go there and you see there's like four different people working on the bike and the truck driver's doing the cooking and it just seems to be like an i don't know if it's easier but i, I think what's been lost is that team between the rider and the mechanic yeah, so much it used to be like me and the rider against the world even if the kid was on the same team you still felt it was only you and him and you'd do everything to help that kid but now it doesn't feel quite so no now that i i i think even more so there is this like the mechanics sort of bolt stuff together now where because someone hands him the engine someone hands him the suspension and then well i feel like it's on. more like the mechanic stays with the team now and then the rider just comes through whereas before what Bob's trying to say is you stuck with that rider wherever he went, I'm guessing. Is that yeah, yeah, that's how you got the big jobs is you got with a guy and as he got better, he got the better jobs, yeah. you take him with you. And that's where I kind of dipped out because my paperwork wouldn't allow me to do that. So I got caught out at the end at Suzuki because it was at the same time as I, Robbie was offered 250 team deals. I was going with him and Albertine got married, didn't renew his visa properly. And then Loaco's dad tried to cause Ian Howe some problems, and so we called immigration. So it was just a clusterfuck. It was just got screwed up. Ah, oh, okay. So it is what it is. You can't complain about it. You yeah, get, seems you get like caught a... in these situations, and it's nothing you've done wrong. Yeah, so. when you're abroad, difficult. Well, same when oh, when you went was the same. Same anything when you're abroad. Even if um, I listened to the Hunter Lawrence Jet Lawrence documentary or podcast they done, and they were saying. Same thing there, being Australian, you come to Europe and they said you can't pay you. Similar to thing, if you was going to a factory Suzuki, they're like, well, how do we pay you? And like, well, uh, so yeah, I it's, got my it's, visa. You're so. a foreigner, aren't you? That's the yeah. bottom line. Is You're a foreigner in a, in a strange land and people tend to stick with their own. It's a harder job. But also, when you go there, you haven't got the baggage that the other mechanics have got. You've got a family, you've got no, yeah. you know, so you are just working, you've got nothing else to do. Got, your main point of contact is your rider. That's nice from a from a rider's point of view. When when you, I remember when I come up, the best mechanics are the ones that have no baggage. Yeah, you just got because you've got nothing else to worry about. And that's way. normally the foreign ones because they come over and um, they've got nowhere to go back to. They live at the workshop. They're from. They're not from that country. All they want to do is work on your bike. They've got no other. Yeah, and also I think that does show a level of commitment from that guy to want to do that so bad to give up everything. To go and just live out of a gear bag and just... I think that's why um, Mitch Payton at Pro Circuit, he hires a lot of foreign mechanics for that yeah. reason. Yeah. I think he thinks if they want to come that bad, they he sort of leaves everything to them, so it makes it hard for them to get there. And he says, well, if they want to jump through all these hoops and be here, then I respect that. And yeah, uh, exactly. They obviously want a job. Yeah, he's a clever guy. So, But the trouble is, once you get further on than a pro circuit thing you start into it's not work visa it's green cards and it oh it just turns into a yeah real drama it's when you have to get a ring on the finger in it find one to marry oh, yeah that's what that's <laughs> what they do yeah yeah well, I, we look down that road <laughs> but it's uh it's not so simple as that no it's that's messy so, as well now yeah but it, it, you know like i was lucky with the dbr thing that i got a journalist visa which gave me until my passport expired unlimited travel to the states so when you all right so then you as a mechanic Robbie Reynard. You that said, was 98, yeah. I mean, going back, let's uh, say 93, I was in the States. Then in the winter, a guy called Tom Morgan, who was a former factory Jeff Ward's mechanic, offered me to build engines. He was porting engines, but he was spending too long assembling them, so he paid me. So I lived in Clearwater, building engines for him while he was porting them, and he was teaching me how to do engine tuning and stuff, which was cool because I learned a lot of stuff I didn't know before. And then a guy called Joe DeCosta, an American guy who worked for Suzuki, uh, asked if I would be interested in working for Billy Lyles in Europe. And Billy's just come off his Action Workshop Honda thing, and he was rider for the Vertimati, the four-stroke people. So we went there, I worked with him. Like three months I walked out, I couldn't do it. Was, Back in Europe, this is? Yeah, yeah, we lived in Monza, lived in Italy. Oh, okay. So we got the truck from Action Workshop, he, he leased that for a year, picked that up, drove to Italy, started trying to build these four-strokes, and he just like three weeks before the first race. It was Billy and Joel Smets on the team and we just didn't have enough bits. Billy was breaking everything you gave him. Smets is a big old boy and we just, between us, we're like, look, one of us needs to go because to give the other an opportunity. And so I quit. I couldn't do it anymore. I just didn't have the hours in the day. I was knackered. I just I was, mus I was miserable. 
Is that you'd come? So you'd gone to America, come back, and then went back to America again. I went back to America in '96 with Paul Eddie. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking, Paul Eddie. Yeah, that was '96. Oh, enduro. Well, it's yeah, not enduro. It's like multi lap enduro. Right. Okay. Stuff, so. Yeah, I was gonna say. So you've done it all then. A bit of enduro mechanic in. Yeah, the enduro stuff's hard work. People don't give those guys credit enough, I don't think. Oh, the music to Billy's ears, that'll be. No, it's fuck. As a, I don't know, as a rider, Jesus, nothing to do with me. But the mechanics, you know, like when you go out in practice, the bike's out there for 10, 15 minutes, you get to like check everything. I don't know practicing that multi lap enduro, I think. First time you see him is half an hour in. That's a whole moto. Yeah. First time they come past. And you think, oh, if he's done a lap, nothing's going to fall off. <laughs> and then you're trying to calculate the fuel stops and all that. Oh, it's intense, man. Yeah. What, was, what was he doing in GNCC as GNCC such? stuff, yeah, Factory Suzuki. And um, so I worked with him in the end of 96, we went over. 97, worked with him. Then Factory Suzuki, we ran out 98. And then 99, I was supposed to work for Mike Brown for your boss. And um, never happened. For oh, when he was on Cat Honda? Yeah, so Brownie approached me, knowing I had visa issues at Bercy, asked me if I'd work with him following year and I'm like yeah no problem and so I came home thinking that was done and then when I came back Keith was doing it so I'm like well, you're yeah. gonna argue with that oh, he's got his dad doing it and that's yeah. the end of it you know what I mean so and then I went back out with Paul the following year in 2000 2001 at Kawasaki which years was, was Jamie out there as well because it didn't hang about with you yeah Paul Jamie everyone? Jamie was there when I was first there in 93 he was at Pro Circuit oh okay yeah then I say factory well, factory team green Kawasaki with Paul but we were Pro Circuit at that point so I spent a lot of time in PC so did did Pro Circuit run an enduro team than a GNCC yeah, team? Yeah, they sponsored the. They were su- supplier to the Team Green team because so that's what Mitch actually done. <laughs> Mitch was beat desert off, racing. He was wasn't a desert. It? He loves the off road stuff and Bones yeah. especially. Bones really loves the off road stuff. So if you were like Team Green off road guy, you could get whatever you wanted out of there. It was meant. Yeah, I've seen pictures. Up, um, when I was when I used to go there, I used to get on really well with Mitch. So I used to go over his house and. You know, yeah, he used to show me pictures of the desert racing. And yeah, all that no, sort he's of thing. big into that. I mean, like, you used to spend every night at PC sitting, drinking beer while they're on the dyno, and it's like a who's who there. That's how you know all your people. Yeah. And there was Ali Seymour there and Joey Mauer and all the guys that were faces were all just sitting around drinking beer after the hours. You know, that's where you go. I must admit, even when we went, you just go in and you crash into every rider and any, oh my God, anyone like, and everyone would be at, like the, like at the show. It's like a who's who. The motocross action guys are there, all the test guys are coming in. Yeah. Especially, it was good. Especially in January when everybody's out there. It's like the go-to place. If you had a flat tyre, you go to PC and get yourself fixed. Yeah, you just up. get everything fixed. It's close, isn't it? It's close to all the tracks as well, yeah. I guess. So. so it's a good place to be. But, you know, Mitch works some hard. You know, Mitch, he offered me a job like four years on the trot. And then the fifth year, he said to me, he said, I'll never offer you a job again. <laughs> Fuck, I've upset him. And he's like, if you ever need a job, you come and see me. But I think he does work them hard. They all say that, don't they? Yeah. I and mean, the thing that bothered me is like, the race mechanic's hard enough. But like Mitch would... Come on, tell me. That ain't me. Who's the That's me. Tell me, 11, 11 episodes deep and you're still not worked out. He's got a bit of cash as well, eh? Oh, Rob wanted a tenner to come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but like Mitch would, you know, you'd work on your, from what I can see, you'd work on your bike all day and then if if you were done, they'd have you working on some amateur kid's bike or... Yeah, it, it don't like, stop. Fuck, or w- literally walking around a workshop cleaning something. If you, I think it's even worse if you haven't got a ride. If your ride is injured, then your job's a real nightmare in yeah, this workshop. I think, so. I think so. But, you know, he's a successful guy. Who are we to say he's not doing the right, you know? Yeah, he's surrounded himself with winners and doers and yeah. done well from it. When, so. um, when I used to go out in the winter in 2011 when I rode for CLS here, because there was that link then all of a sudden yeah. with Pro Circuit when CLS team was, I don't know, they used to buy all the parts anyway. Everyone buys everything from Mitch, don't they? He doesn't yeah. really give much away. Um so the team obviously had a deal, but my mechanic come out and it was his dream. Like he was a um, Belgian mechanic, Ito, and he, he was so happy. Like the Mitch says, I oh, if you want your mechanic can do the bike in the um, it, it was out the back of his workshop, like in the back room where the tr- they parked yeah. the truck. Yeah, and I had a little garage at the house, and I got Ito a, a truck to drive. Just like I spent this three grand on a truck, a little Toyota Tacoma thing, and. Um, I said to him, you, you can do the bike in the garage or you can do it at Pro Circuit. They've got a little bay for you out the back. And he was like, I'm doing it at Pro Circuit. And he, he just yeah. set off in the morning in his truck. He was the same when he beers after work, yeah, and oh, yeah. sweep the yeah, workshop, like loved that. it. To join them for the little beers at six o'clock, he'd leave a, when I wasn't riding for a day, he'd leave at seven in the morning and he'd come back at like eight at night. And I'd just say, good day. And he was just like, 
the best. <laughs> he was he'd have the beers. And he was like, I, I was having beers with Mitch and the guys after. And he was like, incredible. I, I, I'm so happy with this. Like, thank you, thank you. And uh, he was the, over the moon to yeah, be it's in a that fun situation. Place to hang out. It is. Some of the stories come out of there. Is just as a mecha- like a dream thing funny. as a mechanic, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And it's like if you want to get on, you need to be seen there. Really, that's yeah. So after you'd done your time at um, mechanic, and I'm guessing, it, did you then? Because you stayed in America then, because you was DBR yeah, but and ni- Smith at as the well. end of '98. DBR approached me about doing some like a how-to series, which is where the dot wob thing came from. It was basically they stuck me in a doctor's coat and. This is how you stick stickers. Oh, ah, really? That's where you, that come from. Yeah, yeah. This is how you bleed brakes. This is how you change wheel bearings. I remember seeing those in the when I was a kid getting the dirt bike rides. That's where I sort of remember seeing. No, we used to go and shoot those two or three episodes at a time, and that was good because it got your name out there and everything else. So that was not ninety nine. I was doing a lot of that, and then I was I carried on doing that. That's when I got the work visa because that was really good for Kawasaki. Um, so that helped me a lot, and then. Um, the magazine thing didn't really kick off until I was working for Smith, which was like oh three. Started with Smith goggles. They approached me. At, I was over there for what was going to be the Nations. That was oh two, maybe the end of oh two. That was supposed to be the Nations at some Indian reserve somewhere. That never happened. Mm, I remember. And I was with Jamie, and they did some race at Champions Race at Glen Helen, and I got approached there to do Smith goggles, and I'm like goggles. I'm not fucking goggles. But it turns out instead of doing one guy with everything, you're doing thirty guys with the goggles and that, and they're quite. What's the word? They're quite. It's quite a hard job. It's quite. Hard, it's a lot harder than I anticipated. I thought it was going to be a piece of piss. Yeah, but it's you're dealing with Ezra Lusk and these guys, and they're really weird about what they want. It's an important job as well, like vision in the race. It's yeah, big, it is. It's a you, lot bigger deal than I. I properly underestimated it. I did. You know, I thought it's going to be a piece of paper, but it's really quite tense. And that, that's when I met you. Yeah. Yeah, that's the era I know you from, 05 yeah. onwards, really. Well, I got approached from Steve Gutteridge to help you when you were on 85s. Oh, really? Because you had UVEX goggles. Which yeah, we did, fucking yeah. terrible, apparently. <laughs> and Steve came to me and he said, look, can you can we run the UVEX strap? And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do that. But Steve's a good egg, you know. Yeah, Steve's said, good. He point. said, well, if we can just get them through this year, we'll sign for you for nothing next year. Oh. I think we did, didn't we, or not? Yeah, then I had you from then and then in your pro career until you went to the States, really. Yeah, yeah. you were Smith a long time. No, not, well, not long. Uh, you were Smith until you went to America. Did I wear Smith on KTM yeah. both years? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you were my bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember, I remember. Well, Smith was like the top goggle at the time. Yeah, no, it? it was the nuts. And, you I know, don't know why it had... I, it was just one of the best. Like, I was remember being so happy to wear Smith goggles. Yeah, it's good stuff. End of the day, and they were paying me to make sure you guys were happy. So you had a guy who just. My job on a Friday was find Wob. He'd be dragging a massive Ojo kit bag through, and I'd literally <laughs> find him in the paddock at whichever race we're at, and he'd just hand me. You'd hand packets. me like packets of them, wouldn't you, with packets. all different things written on them. Yeah. In you, no one else done that service in Europe at that time. No, well, that's when I was in the States, but you know, the first three years, I think that's where I got burnt out from going to the races because it was like every supercross, every national. Then, when there was a week off, or even if there wasn't a week off, Loretta Lynn's, Vegas, Mini, Mini, whatever it's called. And then, whenever there was a proper week off, Grand Prix. And I did that for three years. So I worked like 45 weekends. So the, go- oh, so the goggles were Yeah, and I think, I think what bothered me with the goggles that I realised after about three months and you're not there to say yes to people you're there to say no and like you'd have sunglasses in the truck and people would come up just like small talk oh, what do you think about the truck and you're thinking just fucking ask me for something I'll say no and you can move on because <laughs> I didn't have enough I just didn't have enough to keep everybody happy and it was just they realised soon enough that you're not actually there just to give stuff away you're there to yeah, you're doing a job. It's really hard. We it? used to do that, didn't we? We used to find Wob, try and get some bastard sunglasses. Then we go from <laughs> you straight to Alpine Star, see what we could get free well, out the, of them. The free stuff I used to try at Alpine Star's the first couple of years in GPs. Every week, new socks. New as soon as the Sprinter van come up, he'd beeline for it, be the first oh, sure. there. What have you got for me? What t-shirts? t-shirts? Everyone used to get. You had more. Everyone gave more stuff back then. Than I think now. so. I think a lot more gear was flowing about. I mean, we used to have. I mean, like, I used to have a birthday. They used to have like big trade shows in America like I was born in San Diego and they'd give me all the sample stuff I mean boxes of stuff yeah and it was not like that and that was for you to give away or keep or do what you want with really basically yeah I mean I used to have I think at one time I had 800 pairs of sunglasses wow yeah just that I'd gathered yeah it's nuts but But a lot of them you don't get that now no it's crazy there's a lot of stuff about at the time but it was 
you know, also you you would struggle, you know, like you know, like Chris Porcel, for example. Um, the year he won, Smith, yeah, yeah, the year he won the world championship, and the deal was, I would have the goggles. I'd give you six or eight pairs of goggles, whatever, for the race, and then whatever you'd worn, I'd get back, I'd clean them up, put your name on them, and then you'd have them back again. Well, Chris didn't give me nothing back. No, it does, <laughs> for like it four months, surprise, yeah, and he wanted. The foam from two years previous, which was quite a hard foam, it was really good at like getting the sweat off your face. But if it fitted your face, it was mint. But if it didn't, there was no give. You'd get dirt in if it, your nose yeah. was the wrong shape. And it f- fitted in perfect. So I gathered every single pair of these goggles we'd possibly ever own. And he had like 60 pairs for the year. And by four races in, I had nothing back. <laughs> it just so kept I just them all. started giving him tear-offs. Because I'm like, you're obviously going to do them yourself. Then he was moaning that I wasn't building his goggles. And my, I said, he said, to my, my boss rang me and I'm like, well, you ain't give me nothing. He's like, well, what can you do? Yeah, he's a funny man. I you got unwell with him and his mechanic. His mechanic now is the crew chief at Kimea. So, yeah. he's a good egg. He's really nice, actually. Super his nice. You've done a year with Paul Sale, didn't you? At CLS, yeah. he's, again, character. I really, I oh am really like, well, it's just odd, but I, I get along with him well. And then he, when he come back to GPs, he come back like a couple of years ago and was just floating around the paddock after he come back from America because he split up with his... He was for America money. I'm going to live in America yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, he was done, yeah. And then I, he split up with his missus and now he hates America. He doesn't, didn't want to go anymore. Um, and then he was like this new man, like chatting to everyone in the paddock, high-fiving people. And you just, you, everyone was like, this, what's happened? This man is not, <laughs> this is not Christoph Porcel. Because even when I had him as a teammate, one day you'd, you'd come up and he'd be chatting to your best mate. I remember being in Brazil, riding roller coasters and that with him. Um, and then the following weekend, it just walked past you, completely ignore you, like you, you didn't even, you'd never met this man before in your life. It's yeah, just so a, odd. He was a strange boy, but I liked him. I didn't dislike the kid. He was good as gold, really. He never caused me any dramas, but never moan about nothing. No. Nah. But he'd be stood talking to his mechanic in French and like obviously talking about you. You're like, that's fucking rude, that is. <laughs> yeah, because he would have been, he'd done, that's the type of thing he'd done. He would speak perfect English, but he would have a conversation to his Someone in French and then they'd tell you in English. Yeah. And you know for what they were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Sebastian Super was different. He was more friendly, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was good at that. I got and the old man there, they're all cool. No problem. Mm. You know, the same with the laces. Everybody bows mouths the laces, but they're always right with me. Uh, I see them do some fucked up stuff, but not to <laughs> me. So <laughs> You've got them with both of them. Yeah, Aless we used to go to Alessi. Yeah. They used to hate it when you say I go to Alessi's house. It was fucking yeah, miles no, away. Everybody used to moan but Jeff Alessi was funny. Yeah. I got I, I we got on so well, even with um, Tony. He was like, oh, he's right, never yeah. said a bad... I didn't know why everyone was... He must have been a bit crazy, obviously, with the stories. You probably know more than me, but we used to go up there when I first went to America. So 2009, most weeks we was up there because Kurt Nickel obviously got on quite well with the lessons, yeah. I think, um, because the, the first year <clears throat> we used to go up and just... He would hold races at his house in the week. And because I want racing supercross, and I don't think he was, um, he would literally, and we wanted to te- we wanted to see where he was at. Everyone would sort of go a lessies to see where he was at. He'd fix the track in this desert, like unreal outdoor track, spend hours watering it. Like You can see where he's, if his dad spent the money, but it was all spent on his track trying yeah. to make him better. He'd spend hours on the track. We'd get there. Track would be fully watered. He would have like a team of people with stopwatches around their necks. His missus would stopwatch. Someone else would stopwatch. His like, missus used to write everyone's lap <laughs> yeah, time down. Yeah, everyone's lap time. We'd go out qualifying. He'd have everyone's lap time, see where you qualified. That's where you'd go out for your race. Um, then, yeah, we'd race. It was just nuts. And then he'd have supercross days where you was fully lined up behind the gate. You would set off. He even done it this year. I watched like a live on his Facebook. He was doing supercross races before the season. But yeah, good no, stuff. they were cool. But like... With most people, if you're doing the best you can, they're all right with you. Yeah. It's when you're trying to shortchange people that don't like it. Yeah, true. It's you true. know, it's like with with James. I got friendly with James Stewart because I used to do Ezra's goggles at Smith. And I used to go and find him between races. And after like two supercrosses, he's like, look, you don't need to come and find me. I'd go and find him in his truck or wherever he was. Quite a private guy. Who's this? Lusk or Stewart? Lusk. And no. he would be like, listen, I want... I want three pairs of yellow goggles in my cupboard, three pairs of blue, three pairs of clear. I want it seven laminates, 14 laminates, and a roll-off in each colour. And I'll wear whatever I think I need, and can you just replace it? Yeah. So I used to have to 
go in the truck, upstairs in the truck, and go in his locker and just see what he'd worn and replace it. That was that easy. Well, Yeah, that was kind of easy. Yeah, well, James is sitting there because he's quite a shy kid. And we're not talking about, we're talking about girls and cars and all that stuff. He's a lovely bloke. Yeah. Away from the racing. Yeah. Yet I'd see him out and about in the track and he wouldn't say hello. No. <laughs> he's there to do a job though, isn't he? Very much, but I like the kid. He's funny. You know, he is. Yeah, that is different that's what the outside view to people to someone that's actually sits in the truck and yeah you and see it completely sitting there side, with all you? this gear around you i mean you have to clear a space to sit down there's so much stuff yeah i can imagine he got quite a lot of free shit yeah a lot of stuff and you mr know, jamie dobb was pretty good at collecting the free shit yeah, i remember going to his house good. once and seeing like 80 dc shoes in a box yeah he when was, i first lived there he had so many dc shoes oh he'd collect them i yeah, see i only ever had one set of gear off james that, that gear he, he landed on carmichael wearing so I got that. Oh, from Stuart? Yeah. That's, there's a, uh, there's a question like the on... yellow stuff, wasn't there? Or green stuff? Blue, I think, yeah. Oh, maybe it says swagger that. on the back. There's, yeah. a, there's a good question in there that, was, that we'll come back to, but it was, a, it was about your man cave. Oh, okay. So when we flick the questions up, I'll definitely pull that one out. Oh, I'm getting nervous about them. <laughs> so that was um, it's pretty, pretty um, in-depth career you've had in terms of mechanic in to then goggles to then DBR and so on. What, well, yeah, what do you think is the best part about I think the coolest thing was it was Vegas in like oh three. I was in the back of the truck and I knew Tim March was a BMX guy. I kind of knew him. I didn't know him that well. I came in the truck and said, "We want to talk to you." And I'm like, "About what?" And they were starting. They had a good BMX and a good mountain bike and a good skateboard magazine. And they wanted to start a motocross magazine. And he's like, "You're the man." I'm like, uh, "I'm not a magazine editor, kid. I got a job. You know what I mean? I can't do that shit." And so they like, "We don't need you to be an editor. What we need you to do is get us in places." Well, I can do that. And so they approached me and we started Moto. But what was cool about that is they gave me like carte blanche to do anything I wanted, like hire the photographers, hire the people. It was mint. And I didn't yeah. want to use all the same people. No, just, no offense to Ray Archer and all these guys who were already doing everything. I didn't want it to look the same as everybody else. So we got to pick and choose from all the people who were doing the BMX mags and everything else. So the, the magazine looked completely different. It didn't sell, but it looked cool as fuck. It was oh. cool when it first came out. I remember it. Well, it was cool. It always seemed to carry some clout. What year was that? It came out in like Easter 04, because we, they approached me at the end of 03. Yeah. No, I do remember it all coming out. And my boss was cool enough because I was, he said, as long as it doesn't affect your job, you can do what you want. And I was, I had to go and buy myself an Apple laptop because I couldn't open any of the stuff they were sending me. And I was literally stopping on the side of the road, driving across country, finding a McDonald's, getting internet and sitting there. And and working on the magazine before you had to get on again and do everything else. Um, I'm pretty sure that would have brought some nice opportunities as well your way. That was meant, yeah. You could say is that if you're going to ask someone that knows anyone about riding or riders, you'd probably want to ask, because I'm pretty sure your phone book's quite, yeah, I know, quite stacked up. I know a lot of people, but a lot of the guys who I know have all retired now, you know? Like, I watch the American Supercrosses, and I don't know any of them. No. Even so for, my interest is... Even my start. Even yeah, yeah I me. think that now. Even the young kids, I'm like... Yeah, I don't know who these kids are. I mean, I'm interested if one of the mechanics, but most of the mechanics I used to hang out with are all done anyway. Yeah. I'm interested, like Zach Osborne, but he's done now because I dealt with him. But once you've got that personal connection gone, you're like, I don't care who wins. Yeah, yeah. what I'm watching. When you have someone to follow, it makes this, it makes stuff so much more interesting than yeah, anything. Yeah, because you know a little bit more backstory. You know what they've been through. You know if there's been a drama or if they're doing well or if they're battling through an injury nobody knows about or... Even if the nans died, you know what I mean? Mm. They got the arse about something. So it's much more interesting, but when you don't... Yeah, you need kids, someone to follow, don't you? Even, you know? even now, I think, like, well, Caroli retired this yeah. this week, and that's, like, for me, an end of an eerie, like, fucking exactly. hell. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I mean, I've still got a lot of interest with the Grand Prix, with the bolts and stuff we do, and that's It's like a new thing, getting back into the teams. Yeah, it? exactly. So there we, But I don't deal with the riders anywhere near like I used to. It's more just the team So staff. that. So then magazine, and then... Importing bikes, wasn't it? That was a big part for me. Yeah, well, what I was doing is I was getting paid in dollars. So I'd be talking to... It started off when I was at Suzuki. Like, we were putting bikes together at the end of the year for sale. Because you start with a stock bike, take everything off at the ends of things, like a rolling chassis, build your race bike, and that thing would just sit in the corner of the workshop to the end of the year. And then it's like, oh, you've got to build these bikes. You're like, fuck, really? Worst job in the year. You know what I mean? Trying to make bikes. Oh, build... Build them back up for sale. sale. Yeah. yeah. So you're like... So I'm putting it together, and I said to the team boss at the time Billy Whitley I'm like who buys these you can have them if you want how much so then he told me and I'm like really 
well, if I'm building it, it's going to be mint, isn't it? Yeah. Because I'm going to be in the cupboard getting all the good stuff now because I'm buying the bike. <laughs> so then I went to all the other mechanics said, look, I'll give you 100 bucks a bike to make them nice. All right. Well, they do two a day. It's like 1,000 bucks a week for them. Yeah. Mega. Well, I'd buy all the bikes then. And, I'd and spend, a dollar was good. A dollar was good. And I had money, I had dollars in the bank because I hadn't been spending it. So I had dollars. And I mean, when I was at Suzuki, I did quite well because there's a thing at Suzuki called per diem, which is like per day. Latin, I guess. And it was only like 35, 40 bucks a day, but it was an extra allowance when you were away from home. Yeah. To cover your extra expenses. Yeah, well, even I think when I was at KTM in America, they gave that. Yeah, well, my, my address was in England. So I had it for 365 days for the year. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I just like meant. And then, I, of course, I caught the end of the box van days where the mechanic used to get looked after like 10% of the rider. And I remember that the second Supercross, I picked Robbie up from the airport because he's too young to rent a car. And he'd be like, oh, there's your bonus from last week. And I'd looked at the prize money thinking, oh, I'm in for 60 bucks or 100 bucks or something, which is 10% of his prize money. And he gave me like 10% of everything. Like the clothing, the goggles, the helmet, the money from Suzuki and everything. I got like 1500 quid a week, $1,500 a week bonus. Yeah, that's nice. I don't, they can't still do that now, sure. No, they? well, that's what happened when you get these big trucks and... Yeah, all the teams. All the guys so are there, so that's kind of screwed that up. Yeah, they can't do it to one guy now when you've got five guys. No, exactly. And that's when, like, Carmichael used to have that deal with Chad Watts and it was just getting so much money. Yeah, some... Say... The car, like Carmichael's mechanics were earning millions, weren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, literally. Well, say goose. Five, six hundred grand a year. For a so mechanic? Like, yeah, a lot of bank. Because oh. you'd be on 10% of the championship, Bunny. It was, it was insane. Yeah, so if Carmichael got a million for a championship, that means, grand. mate, he's 100 grand. Then he's got 200 grand because he's won the outdoors well. So then yeah. he's... But was this a deal that the, like, they, the riders would sign with the mechanic or that was part of the riders' they deal? sign anything. It was no. just like an unwritten thing, really. You just the happened. riders used to just like quite happily I say... Th- I think the riders, if they liked you, I think if they didn't... But I think it wasn't, like you said, at that point it was an unwritten rule. Yeah, it's basically what you did. If a rider didn't do it, he was, he was, frowned, an arsehole, he was yeah. frowned upon. Because a few didn't do it. I think, don't think Bale did it, but they don't tip, do they? So that's no. the different <laughs> mentality. But most of them did. And it was... It was quite lucrative. I mean, like, I got to know Carmichael because he'd beat us every week. And the difference between second and first was like $1,400 for me. And we were like eight supercrosses in. And he said hello as he walked past. I'm like, you can fuck off. <laughs> and he's like, what? I said, you owe me 22 grand. Because <laughs> he keeps taking <laughs> And he week. actually apologised to me on the podium that night. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and who, that was when you were who's mechanic last Oh, no, no. Was rain, I was mechanic. No, rain, was, no. Yeah, a lot. Everything is like I spoke to Jeff Emig, and I'm like, every question's 97 for him. What's your best? You 97, 97. Well, same for me. 98 was my pinnacle of my career, I think. You know, so a lot of the cool stuff happened then. With rain, I mean, not that same. I was three or four years with Paul Eddie, and you know, they were fun. Yeah, yeah. F- funny. <laughs> what driving around just to all the races? Oh my god, we had a whale of a time. How, how we got any results? There'll be some miracle. questions about those years, I reckon. In a minute, oh my god, yeah. I've got, got a few people that know you, and I've got some stories who uh, you have to. <laughs> us up on how we got any results is a miracle really did he win out there he won yeah he won a, he won a championship i got the bike in my office come on then give us a story give us one that that rings true yeah, we've got them on there in a minute well yeah i know but we'll see if they tally up with what wob's thinking uh, i don't know if i can even talk about them <laughs> on yeah half the stories you, well you can but it's just you can't at the same time not if there's kids watching it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it was it was fun times for sure. Mm. You know, hanging out with Shirty and Dobber was fun at the time. And was only this is now, in Amer- whilst in America. Yeah, yeah, we were there a lot. You know what I mean? And just driving around. When we were first at Suzuki, we had two vans, and he used to have like a big camper, and I drive the box van. And then at Cowie, we had a big fun mover thing, and it's chaos. And like hanging out at Pro Circuit, then going racing. It was fun, fun yeah. times. All right, I've got, I'm going to pull up some questions now. This is one from Aaron Nelson. He's asked one question, but I'm going to split it into two. So he said, the best race you've ever witnessed, Euro or US, but let's have both. Ryan Hughes and Mike Brown, high point, oh, three maybe, oh, four. I've never seen a race like that. Good motto. Never seen uh, it. I've never was seen it, it. Was that the round before the end of the season? It was like halfway through and Brownie was on uh, Yamaha. I don't even remember what bike he was on. I know Rhino was on a KTM. Yeah, Mahara Troy Brown he was on. I think. I've never seen a race like that. 
I'm was it the race where guys. they was like get bumping each other off the track and Just then they still really pinned down the track and joining back on the like track? It. That was one of them. Another one was Strybos and Van der Berg in like eighty seven. I was with Merv at some Genk or some. We were support for some Dutch championship, and Merv wouldn't give a shit about anybody else but himself. And he said to me, "Come on, watch this." I'm like, "What do you mean?" And at the time, you know, like when you're growing up, you go to the AMCA races, and there's a local guy to us, Rob Aston. You didn't think you could ride a one two five any faster than that guy because he was flat out. How can you go faster than flat out? You know, yeah. and you stand there and watch Van der Berg and Strybos going at it. And you're just like, fuck. <laughs> you just yeah. I would. I've never seen it. I would like to have seen the one two five races properly. I'm yeah. gonna have to do a bit of YouTube in tonight. See if yeah, we can that find was any insane. How fast they the were. one of Wobs. The one that Wobs talking about about Brownie and Rhino is on YouTube. It's on the Great Outdoors. That is the best race I've ever seen. It'll be O th- you wouldn't o put, three, did you say? You wouldn't have put a tenner on who came out of the next corner first. No, they, they was trying to kill each just, other. Yeah, I mean, and they both were just going at it. It was insane. It was the best race I've ever seen. And the, the, it's the, if you haven't seen the Great Outdoors, they're the best um, motocross videos ever. And then that's on there. And the bloke talking about the and them coming into the round and that. 2009 is the best one. When you've done a couple yeah, of bits did a, for him. Yeah, did a bit for him. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, when you see the video, you see a lot more of it when you're in the mechanics area. You don't see a lot. No, you don't. And you just see the bits you see. Another one was when I was with Rob Andrews at Namur in 88, and that's when Carl Chris stopped for a beer. And they used to put the Kawasaki Privateers together. And we're next door to Carl Chris, and I'm hanging out with his mechanic. And we stood there, and the, the commentary is in Belgian or whatever the language, and they, they're all going mental. I'm just looking at him, giving it what's going on. <laughs> he's just going to understand a word. And they're like, oh, he's laughing. He said, if he had a lead, he was going to stop for a beer at the cafe. And I'm like, never. <laughs> I didn't see it, but I was there. And so he did He did stop there, didn't he? He stopped for a beer, yeah. How cool was that? Yeah, that's good. That's the coolest thing ever. The bottom bit. Oh, I didn't see it, but I see the videos. Yeah, because that I, wouldn't happen now, would it? He can pass all covered, all wet, covered in beer. Well, you can't mm-hmm. even race the moon now. Let now have a beer. Yeah, I know, but still, so no one would just. You wouldn't pull over and just neck one of the fans' beers off the side of the track. No, no it was his brother. Oh, was it? Yeah, his, his brother, brother was, had the his beer ready. Was waiting for him. They arranged it. They said, "If I've got like a thirty-second lead," and he looked at him next lap. And his brother's hanging over the fence <laughs> with his beer, and he had like the Oakley he had an open face mask helmet on, Oakley face mask, just lifted it up. Basically threw it in his face. <laughs> and then carried on. That, that was nice because racing the moor, obviously it's gone now, but I got was quite happy I got to race that track. That's insane. Probably. How many times did you get to race it? Uh, 2006, I went and hit a tree in qualifying and knocked myself out. <laughs> <laughs> and then two seven, I went, 2007, I went and won the race. Oh, cool. It's a, it's so to win it in the moor, that's quite cool. Can you imagine trying to get a track like that through, like, uh, like building control now. Oh, it just wouldn't, would it? Would never it? happen in a million years. I, I remember guess. walking it thinking, this is fucking no, it's insane, mad. man. Some of them yeah, walking it is, it's just mad how, thinking now that I was, I raced them or how long ago that seems and walking uh-huh. the track, but I do remember just thinking, this is I nuts. always thought as a, as, how do you remember? Because they all look the same. All the corners look the same to me as a mechanic. I mean, yeah. my days of walking the track, I didn't, nothing to do with me why would I walk the track but it was like you'd go out there thinking you're like at the time it was one of those races where they let you they used to let you around the track on scooters so we used to go and I used to go on out with Jared Smith and we'd just try and tear about just like yeah around. that was good I wish they let us do that now you, even when I started you wanted to let go around a track on scooters yeah we used to have them Honda Cubs and we used to go ripping around and stuff. Honda yeah, Cubs you so must have a fun. couple of those at yours I've got three of them yeah because you can't get them now, can you? You don't ride them because you can't get the plastic you break a plastic it's scrap it? oh can't. really you don't even, they're cool but it's, well, They've all got flat batteries and flat tyres and stuff because you can't even run them. No. They used to be the funnest thing in the world, but... Right, here we go. Luke Bond 23. Do you prefer to work on older bikes or newer bikes? And also, what brand do you prefer? I like a Yamaha. Do you? I don't know why. I like working on Yamahas. I just like the way they bought it together. I've always thought a factory Yamaha's... It'd be raised about Hondas, but I've always thought a factory Yamaha looks cool. Just because yeah. it's much more understated. Yeah, the I old mean, ones or the new ones or old anywhere. ones. I mean, nineties uh, is my expertise, really. You know, eighties I was learning. By the time the nineties come around, I kind of got the hang of it. And throughout the nineties was like the peak of my career. So they're the bikes that I kind of know. Which is why I'm such a pain in the ass building these because I know what they got to look like. Yeah. And so this one here, this is a was this a factory yam considered like at the time? Yeah, that's what. That's as close to as, as close to. We try to replicate it as best we can, but yeah. I know what it's got to look like and things like the Cerakote on the cases, and it's like six attempts in before it's right. Yeah, 
Can't so just, that's why you do. That's why you enjoy the nineties bike so much. Because I, I know my way. I can't build a four stroke. I've never built one. I could probably do it. Yeah, you can work on one if you want but, it. Obviously, oh, yeah, of course I can, but I don't like to. I got you know tone works for me. He's mint at those. Just let him do it. He's yeah. mega at it. You know why would I have a dog and bark yourself? Yeah. Now this is like you say if this is your era and what you used to build, I'm pretty sure you probably do it with your eyes closed. Yeah, that's like that. That's the technology that I understand, and that's the technology that I know how to make work. And if I don't know, I can ring somebody who does. Well, here you go. And this leads on quite nicely to Lee, Lee Gilly's one, or Lee Gill? Lee Gill. Wob, any advice on how to smoothen the power delivery on an RM250? Depends what year it is. He's missed out the year. I've got some on that. So, oh, let me get some of my questions. I've got <laughs> well, you could, hundreds of questions. There's really. a few things you can do. Simpler fly. Simpler. Um, space on the reblock does a lot. You can basically take the, the gasket out of the reblock and make like a 10 mil spacer and that moves the carb away from the cylinder and gets it a nicer power delivery flywheel weight goes a long way so between a flywheel weight and the reed block spacer and then if you want to go crazy you can cut a hole in the back of the piston that smooths it out as well but you're going to break a piston eventually doing that there we go lee we should be charging for that advice shouldn't we yeah, what well, probably will <laughs> I get a bit he knows the name he's going to send us a bill now <laughs> um what's your favorite uh, vets designation bike you've built throughout the years I mean, not the most, uh, John Michelle Bale. I mean, anything you do for that guy is just a legend. Oh, Mate, he's come over and raced the Vet Designation? Yeah, he was 14 or something. But just to build a bike for JMB was big news for me. I mean, I've done them for a lot of people, but to build one for me, I was nervous because he brought his mechanic with him, John Marie, and I've stood there watching and he ain't checking shit. And I'm thinking, oh God, these things are falling apart, man. They just do. It's just like when yeah. you first build a bike like that, you know, they you got to check the spokes, you got to check this. And I'm watching him and I'm thinking... I ain't going to go and tell him what to do. But, oh, but go and check it. Go and check it, please, because it's... Yeah, that's the one. Um, is Tommy the worst customer for pestering you whilst you've been mid-build on a bike? Nowhere near. Nowhere the worst. near, I was going to say that. <laughs> Nowhere near the worst, which is why we don't do... I can imagine you have some people... We don't do many customer builds at all. Do you, I'm guessing you build them and then sell them when they're done. The best way for us is like we build them to order that way the customer gets what they want now people will ring me and they'll say what do you got and i'm like oh got kx 500 cr phone oh i want a 98 cr phone yeah i got one of those what do you want it to look like i want it to look like a hot wheels bike okay so then we go through the spec the price and then i build it to order basically the very few that we end up building and then try to sell that's very rare that happens but then do they not pest you then when they're building it to order yeah but not as bad not too much no not too bad tommy wasn't too bad because no, I was good. It's not like I don't know you and I can't tell you just to do mm. one. <laughs> no, I was. Uh, I just left you to it, you know. No. It takes time. It's it's not not like you're you're buying a part off the shelf. Quite a lot of stuff on Tommy's bike you've had made and done and yeah, tested. Exactly. That and was slow because we hadn't made any of the stuff. So to get the stuff made is a lot of time and effort and money. But now we've got all the stuff. It's a lot easier. And it's like, which is a if big you can click your fingers and you can take the frame and then you can click your fingers and it's back from the fabricators but it's gone for three weeks yeah and then you know the One guy, thing holds the guy who up. does my fabrication builds bmw saloon car roll cages so we can only do it when you've got time he's got a busy job anyway can't yeah. drop everything to do it yeah and then it goes from there to be powder coated so you haven't got the frame for like six weeks yeah i've got one 155 woody your favorite bike of all time and the most factory part you've ever seen on a bike why is it M500 Yamaha? Why is it M500? Yeah, it's the trickiest thing I've ever seen. Who rode that? Uh, Vimon started riding it, got hurt. Uh, so they gave his bike to Kurt Lundqvist and then Leif Pearson rode them. Uh, it was like 87 and 88. They had like six bikes every year. Most so why is he 500? Most, most factory thing you've ever seen. Because the Yamaha at the time didn't make a 500. They made an air called 490. And this thing was nothing like it. It was the factoriest thing you've ever seen. Oh, but, it was literally... Or one of a kind. Well, aluminium frame in 87. So it was 18 years, I think, before that came production. So imagine having something now and it's not going to be in production for 18 years. Yeah, that is no. Things like coolest thing. It's it like bike? prototype MotoGP. Oh, my shit. God, it was the coolest thing. It was like water-cooled, never made a water-cooled 500. And it was just like nothing else. It was the without doubt the most factory thing you've ever seen. But did it work well at the same time? It was all right. I don't think they had the the riders to really justify the bike because uh. at the time the Hondas were successful but sometimes success isn't okay so this one is from uh, Dave Wynn how do you feel the industry has changed over the years and how do you see it in the future 
I don't know. It's <sighs> we said that a little bit before with the one mechanic doing all the bikes. Yeah, yeah, as far as the race team stuff, there's, but that's not the industry. The race team stuff is. It, it used to be one on one, and you go testing, and you go riding, you'd arrange everything. So <coughs> that was good, but the. the I'd say the industry's stuff, booming a bit at the minute. It seems industry's that way. It's good, yeah. But getting the stuff at the moment's hard work. You know, you can't assume anything's in stock. Like I know certain companies are like six months behind. Like I order stuff, and you know they're three months, four months. Yes, yeah, shit, and that's oh, COVID shit. and Brexit for really, you. Yeah, that's caused us a lot of problems. Um, most ridiculous request from a customer. I had a guy wanted me to build like a Ron Lachine nineteen eighty five factory one twenty five Honda from nothing. I'm like, what? But well, you can't even get that. Uh, no, but I mean, we could have made it, but the money and the time would have just been. It's nice that he thought we could do it, which I'm sure we could, but it's not going to be a, uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we do a lot of engineering on these things, but to make, a, you know, that pipe, that, the, that bike had like different frame, like the pipe up the different side. There's a guy in France made, made one to look like it, but that's an insane amount of work. I don't I've, know how much money he had. I've got one question here. It's from um, poor, poor Maddie 125 so you could really ruin his day here or make his day. <laughs> He's got a 93 RM125. He's rebuilding one and he keeps being told they're a load of shit. Mm -hmm. Should he keep it or should he sell it or what does he? What do you think of that bike? A load of shit. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Did one those the forks you put on my Honda? The forks on the 94 to 50 are really good. Oh, that's the one. But it's good forks on a shit bike. Ah. Suzuki's weren't any good till 96. So, mate, you should just bomb it off. I would. <laughs> <laughs> There's your and answer. would you buy it? No. <laughs> no, the Suzuki's weren't the best in 93, 94, 95. I mean, you buy like a 93 Honda, it's a way better bike. Some people say, get some naughty stories from America, but I know it's just awkward trying to tell a story uh, from nothing. It's, it's too, you can't do it. Unless right. you're there and in the moment, it's hard to... Yeah, and things are different. I've got kids and stuff now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the stories flow easy when the cameras aren't on. Yeah, I'll have a few beers, I'll tell you some stories. <laughs> um, this is quite a good question. There's, it's, there's two from the same guy. It's called Wolf N. Du Luke. Um, advice for someone who can't afford the services that you offer but is going to build a replica themselves. And then his other question was, could you get your hands on a Yandergroot horizontal shock? So I'm guessing that's quite a special part. Yeah, I could probably find one. There you go then. And but then I don't know. I'll have to ask the question, but I'm sure we could. But as far as advice to do them, they're just... A lot of it's common sense, but what I do see is a lot of people making a lot of effort and people trying to make them look modern, like they'll put twin wall bars on them, black rims, and they never had them like that. Just don't... don't just stick to what they are. Basically, yeah. It's like all my bikes have always got like normal diameter bars on. We do gold rims if they're supposed to have gold rims. And people just seracoat the death out of stuff at the moment. It's just like, it wasn't supposed to be that colour. Why would you Why would you spend Yeah, you want to keep it how it is. Well, build it to this. Yeah, study, you want it to study look, the bike. You want it to look like it's got a look. Just look at the pictures and do that. Don't think, oh, just because I can do the brakes bonds, well... Don't yeah, do it. Don't get a bit excited. Ah, don't get do. a bit excited. People just Cerakote the death out of everything. And it, Cerakote's a great tool, but... When used in the right way. Exactly. You know, I've been messing around a lot with, like, on that yam, you know, like, I like different textures. Like, on the, on the swing arm, we, like, dry blast the cast section so it's, like, a dull white, and then polish the extruded part just so it just looks more factory. Really. There's, there's a, while we're on that yam, there's a few questions on the yam. What engine work was done to Mike Brown's V... Bet. Oh, I know the answer to this. This was this was, we spoke about this before we come on. Yeah. No, I know. Tell us what it's it is. What? Well, it's just a big right fist. <laughs> yeah, he oh, just I pins know. it. I know. But as you were rebuilding the bike from standard, yeah, we don't tune them. Um, oh, so it's not tuned because I was thinking the same about my bike. What is that in there? Yeah, like? We just run a slightly higher compression ratio, just so you can run decent fuel. The fuel nowadays is so shit. You got to run decent fuel. Yeah. Um, by running decent, them Yamahas, they. The carburetor is mint when it's set up, but it's a bitch to set up. They're very like it's, what, the weather changes five degrees, you're changing the carb. That and, one, that oh, one there. And this, if you ever watch Brownie ride that, you, you can't turn the fuel on until the bike started up. You got to turn the fuel off before you stop it. If you don't, the bike won't start. Oh, there's a lot to it then. Oh yeah, we've got them big float bowls on because on them Mikuni carbs, when they're on the gas, the fuel in can't keep up with the fuels being sucked out. So it gets about half full. Then it starts foaming and the bike starts running lean. You're going to seize it. 
it starts starts misfiring just before it seizes because it ain't getting enough fuel through. So you put the big float bowl on. Problem with the big float bowl, the overflow goes straight into the motor. So you have to set the float so high so when he's on the gas, he's got fuel. Yeah. Oh god, it's tricky. That's but lost as far as, en- as, far as <laughs> I was going to say that's gone over yeah. your head. As I far mean, as engine tuning goes, hand on heart, it's slightly higher compression ratio, but not a lot. Carburation, good set of reeds, good pipe, good fuel. Good fuel's a biggie, and nobody so when, everybody ignores that. S- similar thing to my Honda. Yeah, nothing. So nothing too special. The Honda, yeah, but when you've got the head, is that the same head it come with? That's still on it. Yeah, now. we modify it a little bit. We just so you just it. clean it basically. Just take some material off, so basically the compression ratio is a little higher. Okay. And that you get away with that if you've got good fuel. It won't detonate or anything. So I've got to run out of decent fuel. Uh, you can get away with super plus on that as long as it's fresh. Yeah. Don't go using three month old stuff. It's um I think even y- you've said it yourself and probably in some of the vlogs that we made that they're not the easiest things to run and ride. Like if you No, people think they're easy, but they weren't easy twenty five years ago. And you know, as far as fuel, I've given you in the garage a can of fuel left over from Farley because it won't keep. You might as well have it. Oh, okay, perfect. Do you want money for that or not? That'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, the I'll have, that, I'll have that ten off you. Yeah. yeah, I'll give that. The um, <laughs> favorite project and build you've ever done? Oh, I don't know. I've done quite a few now, haven't we? I don't know. I like obviously. I like putting. I like putting RM two hundred and fifty engines in RMZ frames. Why would you do that? It's just a mint bike when it's done. RM, so it'd be an RM... RM 250, anything after 04 was a good motor. Because when I was at Suzuki, uh, I was hanging around at Suzuki a lot when I was at Smith. And um, in like 04, because they decided they weren't going to make two strokes anymore, Yeah. all the development, they didn't hold anything back. They just put everything on it. So the 05, 06 RM 250 is like factory bikes, really good. 252 stroke. 252 stroke, best motor in the world. So, take so that your man bike. that's got that 125, he needs to swap up for a 250. Yeah, the night is... I mean, I, I just bought a mint RM 250 as well. Are we getting a build out of it? No. Keeping it? Mm, for a bit, I think. What? Well, you must... You've not bought it as a... You obviously need to build it up. Or is it already done? Yes or no, I got I got a text from a guy who I, I supply titanium for, who builds motors for a guy in America. And he's like, this, this any good to you? I thought you might be a bit of you. And I'm like, it's a Carmichael 250 Suzuki. And I'm like, yeah, it's one of those replica things. You know, See the pictures. I'm like, you're fucking kidding me. It's the real thing. Oh, like really? Proper factory one. And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I rung Ollie Stone. I'm like, kid, how far are you from your Belinda? He's like, oh, not bad. Not far. I said, can you get down and pick this bike up for me? Yeah, That's just, not far at all. I think I went to your Belinda hospital before. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, going to say another name. And he's like, uh, well, get him to bring it to Pro Circuit. I'm like, uh, uh, d- d- no, no, you don't need to bring in that thing to Pro Circuit. <laughs> Out the back of there, they go like, they'll be like seagulls around the thing. Yeah. So Ollie went and picked it up. It's in his garage now. And that's coming over at some point. That's being took apart this weekend and being shipped. So I'll have it and then we'll, it hasn't got the right numbers on or nothing, but it's the real thing. And so I sent a few texts. I took, I took the picture, sent a few texts to a few boys I know. And they were all like, oh yeah, she's real. Oh, we'll have to come and try wouldn't and get that on in, video. Wouldn't have the people in America been interested in that or what? Or did yeah. he not want to sell it to someone out there because it's a bit, he shouldn't have it? <sighs> There's a bit of that involved as well, but... I'm guessing, like, you get quite some nice offers across the table. Like It's weird because we buy and sell some nice stuff. We do get offered a lot of nice stuff, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just like you're the guy to deal with it, so you're the guy to get rid of yeah, it. I'm yeah, I'm guessing you you can price it. You can, you'll can you know what it is. It's actually hard to price. You just don't know what you're going to... Some of the stuff, some of the prices being thrown around now are just crazy. Yeah. Well, you've just got crazy money for that. That ain't crazy money kick compared to some of the deals I brokered in the last month. Really? Mm. Oh, we've well, got the factory one, obviously, that we, we've we showed a little bit on the blog. You had the factory Everts one. Yeah. Yeah, that's gone. I've it's sold that. Yeah. So she's all fully, fully built, ready to go? No, but I've sold it. Oh, it's still there. Still, still sat where still it is. It still looks exactly the same as it did, but <laughs> I've been paid for it. But no, I brokered a deal for one bike, 180 grand last month. No oh, way. One of yours? No. Oh, Can we say what the bike is? Buying. No. Can't say what it is? No. A motocross bike? Yeah. Fucking hell. I know, it's crazy. What rider? I can't tell you. No, you don't have to say the year. I can't tell or you. Or they would know, I suppose, if you told you the rider. Can you tell us when we turn all this shit off? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what brand? I can't tell you anything. <laughs> the guys who buy these don't want anybody to know. Yeah, no, that's fair enough, isn't it? Like, Which country? Are you telling you? You said no, mate. I'll tell you in a bit. I'll tell them I will on the next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a lot of favourite to know bike. what time you're home for tea. 
<laughs> reckon you'll be home probably what's the time traffic wasn't too good getting here no um what part have you made that you're the most proud of parts you make now someone's asked that I think that real T bike. handles. T handles are cool. Yeah, cool. T cool. handles are really cool. Apart from bike, I think that that brake carry on your bike's pretty neat. But T handles are cool because just the reaction you get from like proper proper doers, proper all the factory mechanics are busting for them. The T handles. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah because it's too it's them. it's a, it's too good for the job it you does. You don't need them, but you don't need anything, do you? You no. don't need a Ferrari either, do you? But you still no, buy yeah, one. You know true. what I mean? And it's like those guys are just going crazy for them, and you can't get your head around. You like. That's cool, but it's like a little bit took me by surprise a little bit. What? How much people were sort? How yeah. they match their sort? Well, mechanics after. in fairness, you don't get a lot here. The rider gets the painted out. Yeah, and, and so all the you have your own nice thing. It's nice. Exactly. Yeah. No, they, you know, like I went to Matley and, you know, the carry guys are chasing me from and then ten foot later. They got Roger Shenton at HRC. He wants four sets for his guys and. Yeah, it's that nice got, thing for like, a Ben Watson bought three sets for his mechanics. Fucking as hell. a gift. It's as not a too gift. much money. Oh. Maybe yeah, but that's it's like you say. Maybe you should take a leaf out of his paint uh, book and a little bit of championship bonus. Yeah, you should. This is Ben. I could, there's a, there's a, I could do with a set in here, Tom. You know. I thought Wob was going to bring a set out today. I'm going to have a deal with Wob on Mate, a set. I in literally there. just came from the welders. Now that's where I went first. They just welding the new ones up. But it's like 250 sets of T bars. You never send so much stuff. It's a van full. Oh, you was dropping them off. That's on where the way. I came on the way here. Yeah. Ah, okay. This um, this pipe on Tommy's bike here, this JSV one, that's a, a that's pretty nice. special. Yeah, nice. no, he does a good job. Yeah, I've been following him now. On, and yeah, yeah, yeah I followed him as well. Oh, some tricks mean. though. And also, what he does is he's got all the like these nineties bikes, and also, no disrespect to FMF Pro Circuit Bills, whatever. You need a European pipe for European track. It just works better. I don't know. Ask me why. It just and European pipe don't work that good over there. But if you have yeah, it, odd, isn't it? And also, you know, Yen's dad was Doma, Dominic from Doma. Yen's granddad's Piero Slager, who owns Spess and Slecton. So he's got all those different specs. Yeah, to, to go off. To go off. So you'll just pick the best one. I mean, like you've only got to see Brownie on that on the weekend and see how good the pipe works. Was the, um did Brownie Brownie didn't hole shot, did he? No, he we struggled to get him out of the gate, in fairness. Um he was struggling because he'd been practicing on a 450 and a 450 just dumped the clutch and go, don't you? Yeah. And so, and he couldn't really hear the bike. He wasn't making excuses. Um, True, it's funny he's not Brown. practiced on that. When was the first time he rode it? Friday. Up and down outside the van and then the first race. Oh, so, it, yeah. No, no, so a lot of the other English riders have obviously been practicing that. That's the benefits of what they do. You know, Brownie comes over, the Americans, they come over and they see the bike on Friday, start it up, ride it up and down the road until they get yelled at. And have a go. And then they go out and practice and they're timing it. Yeah. You've got three laps to get a gate position he's never ridden the bike before in his life so I'm gutted that the, the last round of the British was on the same weekend because yeah. I've never been but it's a good race yeah, it's a good I'm race. everyone sings its praises it's a seeing, lot of stress um, for us seeing the bikes just general people that I follow on Instagram a lot of them oh, have went and just seeing the bikes coming you out. walk around there's some lovely stuff just people. the, the oh. stuff that the people themselves have built the bike so you can see so much oh my god yeah and you see so much time effort and like how proud they are of the and bikes the speed, they push around the pit the it's speed nice. they're all going I mean not just my guys the speed they're all going it's like you, it, like when Sean Hamlin came over and Keith Johnson I'm like don't underestimate these kids you never heard of no even general British kids yeah like Ryan Vos on it just yeah I was so surprised fast. with Vosey fuck me like, oh but god, I think he's, he's been going, putting effort in for this so race so quick and so did like Brian McKenzie and yeah, Bry come out swinging. Yeah, and you got Nev. Nev, oh, Nev's Nev, and he loves it, doesn't he? And yeah, he Nev. Like but then fast. Nev's always fast, and he's so good on the two strokes because he rides him. He rides a lot. He just loves it. Yeah. See, Brownie but, hasn't ridden a two stroke. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Since 2019, so that's to race with Nev. Um, I'm not sure how old Nev is now, but what's Brownie? 48, 49. Nev's not 49. He's like fucking Peter Pan, isn't he? Yes, <laughs> absolutely nuts. Before we come on here, I, we were talking a little bit about the nation, uh, the vet nations, and the the way Brownie rides the bike. Every picture you see, you just go, "Wow, he looks tricky." He looks like there. a twenty year old on the bike. Yeah. Then he takes his helmet off. Yeah, and the thing is with Brownie, like he will say, he actually don't mind not getting the gate. He said first corner, first straight. He said, "I'm fucking spitting feathers. I'm angry, screaming because he's not got the gate. He screwed it up in his head." He said, but by the second turn, he's like, come on then, let's have it. <laughs> yeah, like and he enjoys like, the race he coming through. enjoys that, yeah. I can see that at that, at that level, obviously, because he, Brownie just wants to win at any any point and he's got that in him, but yeah. to do it at that race... I don't know where he was disappearing into the woods and every time he came out of the woods, he'd pass somebody else or I don't know what he was doing back there. 
cut in the course or something because he was taking time out of people. Really? Yeah, I don't know what he was. He, I've, I not asked, seen the I whole, asked him, I've not seen the, the lap. I've not really. I asked him and he said, down the hills. I don't know why they were going so slow down the hills. Really? That was he said. I don't know. I know. He's by, so aggressive on a bike. I know so Brian McKenzie in the first race came up after. He gave, he fucking parked me. He said, <laughs> oh, really? I had nowhere to go. <laughs> and I said to Brown, he said, no, you parked McKenzie. He said, yeah, he hadn't pissed me off, so I didn't drop him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, if he wanted to, he'd have he dropped would. him on the floor. But he hadn't pissed him off, so he's like... Oh, Mike Brown, he's the, the first ever jersey of a motocross rider I got. Boost yeah. Mobile, yeah. He's a oh, legend. Yeah. Straight in a frame. How bed. did you get that? Jamie Dobb. Really? Yeah, he, he gave it me as a gift. I put it in my bedroom. I was only young. Yeah, And Brownie. then years later, I worked with him at KTM in America. He's a good egg brownie. Good when lad. he was doing what? Enduro? Um... I don't know what he was doing out there. He was doing a bit of Enduro, but he used to come into KTM a bit while we were there. I can't remember what he would have been doing at that time. No. I, he's such a quietly spoken, like softly. You wouldn't. The anger issues that kid's got. He's men. It makes <laughs> me scream. He's so funny. He's so bitter about certain stuff. He's so funny. Yeah, I I like I like racing him, and I he one year I, in two thousand and seven, I was on factory KTM, and me and Brownie come into the last round of the British Championship, and I think I had a. I can't remember if I was leading or he was leading. I was leading up to the second to last round. And I had a big crash. Knocked myself. Oh, no. Knocked myself out the week before. Then went to Whitby. And then my... You had three in a week. Yeah. Knocked myself out three times in a week. Mm-hmm. It's not um not recommended. But then my... um, uh, What smashed off the disc brake or the sprocket? Sprocket, um, I think. A DNF one race. Something. I think, I'm pretty sure the bolts come out of the disc brake and it... Locked the whole way, rear wheel. Yeah, anyway, I crashed one race and that happened in another. I think I had a 30-point lead and come out um, so many points down and then we had one other race and then the final round and I think Brownie beat me by one point for the oh, British yeah. Championship. <laughs> and the year before that, Carl Nunn beat me by one point. Oh, fuck. But the thing is with Brownie, he grew up in the 90s when those guys like, invented block passing, really. You know, those guys... You know, I think he grew up with Matasevich, Bradshaw, all those. And boys were just nailing each other on every opportunity. Yeah, he was. Fu- he's just aggressive rider, isn't he? He is. Yeah. Now, if you put a, a strong pass in, everyone fucking kicks oh, off. Oh, I know. Back no. in the day, it was expected, wasn't it? That's yeah, you were you getting did. slammed. I mean, you couldn't punch anybody without getting in trouble, but you could. You could put a proper stern. Yeah, there was oh, proper. Yeah. Then, when you watch the racing on the two strokes, even more so, just because it's that era, where they shoot down the insides and they seem to get a lot closer. Yeah, I think so. The tracks are different. You know, like back when we were racing 125s, that you know, like you'd have special gearboxes where the transition from second to third wasn't very much because they'd, they'd shift third on the face of a jump. Yeah, you had to though, didn't you? Well, you'd rail the corner in second, hit third as the front wheel's going up. The, you just yeah, like, nuts. you don't want to do that now. No, you've got some confidence to do that, and <laughs> yeah, every fine. lap. But That's like you said, thing. I think not once is it the racing. You can get closer because tracks were completely different. Yeah, that's what the whole two stroke, four stroke thing. I mean, I know where I sit on the, you know. And it's where it's going to go with electric coming going forward, you know. Yeah. You do think that's going to go that yeah. way? It's got to, it's got to. Yeah, yeah. Not, I mean, I think all it's going to take is one manufacturer, and it might not even be a a brand that you know. It's like with cars, you know. Nobody heard of Teslas five years ago. No, and it could be a brand, and they they've only got to go and do a supercross, and then the bikes are going to be so. That other good. company almost did it. Just seemed Alter. to be so close. Yeah, they were close, and then Harley Davidson bought them and, and used the technology and stopped the motocross. Yeah. Yeah, see, that was odd, because that was a good bike, wasn't it? It was a good bike. You know, I don't know whether the Triumph thing might go down that road. I mean, I haven't heard, but it wouldn't be wouldn't <laughs> surprise. Why would you spend, it, no. You'd have to give Carmichael a ring. Why would you spend all that money developing a, a petrol engine that's kind of defunct? Yeah. Well, what's defunct? You, means coming away. Yeah, getting away it's from like that. it's done its time. Yeah. You know, so you're, I don't know. I'm not saying that could be absolute. I haven't heard it. No, anything. it's not. The I think You're either going to sound like the, the most... Clever man in a few years, if it is. Or. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do think it's going to be, and people are going to hate it because the noise and everything, but I think the, the four strokes have done so much damage with noise and the cost of racing and also the injuries. And I don't know, i just not a big fan. No, I don't know. I think the tracks have changed so much. I think we can do it on another. I was thinking of doing that before, but the, just the way the tracks are now, even to when I started racing, that's not an issue with the four strokes, but the... It's so, they're so different now. Yeah, a four stroke. The way the, the track is, develops. Is the four stroke. A four stroke's just really efficient. When's efficient been fun? You know what I mean? Well, no, it's, it's like not. That's a the two difference. stroke. It's making a load of noise going sideways. Smells nice. And it's, yeah, going nowhere. And also, the the noise doesn't travel. Like the problem with a four stroke is like the noise is like 
it's like a mini sonic boom and it travels like mm. miles whereas two stroke sounds noisy when you're next to it but you get a mile away you can't hear it mm. that's true um there's a question for you about the best nightlife slash motocross party you've been to Vegas, of course. Yeah, it's got to be some Vegas Supercross. Yeah, I mean, you go out the last round, at the last round, and you don't get into into the casino till midnight. And yeah. of course, you've had a few drinks, getting ready, and whatever. And it's like it's a long night. That is because you've been at work since like seven in the morning. You oh, as a, when you was doing the mechanic in through yeah. the day, and then you then fin- you get your day's a finished. quick shower out drinking like a mad thing because everybody's <laughs> been out all the industry guys have already been there so you're trying to catch up so you drink like an idiot because everybody keeps buying your drink <laughs> so there were some big nights some big nights in there we've yeah. had a couple of them in Vegas after party. yeah some very good Vegas yeah I used to hang out with Emig a lot in Vegas he was a lot of fun there Emig was um, loved a bit of roulette didn't he loved, oh, loved yeah. chucking it at the tables yeah, I had one night with Emig and I ended up wearing his watch as well as mine because I think he thought I was less messed up than he was and I was in a right pickle <laughs> <laughs> and we were sitting at a, we we're sitting in the hard rock and it's like it's like Mitch and me Emig giving me money to gamble. I don't know what I'm doing. It's Wyndham. Wyndham and Mitch Chaos. Big. Chaos. I've seen um and they spend a lot fifteen hundred bucks a hand mind. Yeah. And we even Mitch is starting to back out of it and Wyndham's like, just sell another pipe and and Emig's giving me money and I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. And I was losing thousands. And then I remember Kevin said to me, Look at the door and I'm like, What do you mean look at the door? Like this squinting <laughs> and everything's just dark and, and somebody's walked in and it's daylight it's like 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> fuck yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's like a massive night and I'm like I'm out I'm going to bed man I actually walked home like a mile up the strip just proper walk of shame yeah if, you, if you're ever in um, Vegas for Supercross head to the Hard Rock Hotel because that's yeah. where it's all at it afterwards. used to be it's gone now isn't it has it it's not there anymore yeah they're bulldozed don't they what this type the whole hotel now I think so I mean, I you know. may want to Google it, but I think... That's no cool. way. Fucking yeah. hell. And the thing is, now it's all, without sounding like bitter against your sponsors, it's all the Monster Energy Party and everybody's got to be seen. So, I don't know, it don't feel like the... Yeah, it wouldn't the be circle, the same as when you The Circle it. Bar at the Hard Rock was... No, just, the Circle Bar was in full swing when we were... Yeah, but it's changed again, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the Circle Bar was... That was the place, wasn't it, on a Sunday night. so funny. And, Saturday night. you know, when I was there with Denny and all that, it was... Like, you haven't done a night out until you've done a night in Vegas with Denny. It's proper like hangover stuff. Like you remember all limo, strip club. Oh God, we were there. <laughs> and it's like Dre's, yeah. which is this after hours club. Yeah, and, Dre. So oh, that's there. Oh my God. And it's, like, it's proper, uh, the hangover is a lot closer to reality than. Yeah, I can imagine the Vegas after party in the 90s was a lot better than the. Oh, uh, now. The, can you imagine just it going back now? It seems to be now. A lot of everybody, they just want to be seen. Seen, yeah. It's just more Put about... pictures out. Exactly. Before then, it was nothing. Well, you can't do anything now because you'd get photoed in a club yeah, doing something. Exactly. Yeah. Back we, then, before social media. Oh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, they were just party no because they wanted to party. Yeah. No, exactly. And like, once you're in, you know, like when I started work with Denny, I knew all those guys. But once you went in with Denny, you were like, you were with, with Denny. And then all of a sudden, like, I knew Jeremy, but... Then you're with Jeremy, yeah. you know what I mean? And you're in this little inner circle and you end up going to these clubs after. Dallas was always a big one. Fuck, they all came to Dallas. I'm like, what's the big deal about Dallas? Ooh, big night out in Dallas. <laughs> really? Oh, it's a big night out, yeah. We Fun. had a big night out with, um, who did we have? We, we was the same thing. We sort of like went on a night out, not really expecting anything after San Diego Supercross and Tommy's management company, WMGL. Is it WMGL? Yeah. At w- the time. WMG. Astafan. Yeah. yeah. Next minute we're, on some table with Chad Reed, then we're off somewhere else with some skateboarder and then we get dragged back to some party in fucking Valentino Rossi's in there and we're like, fucking oh, hell. No, yeah. like, the biggest night I've ever had was San Diego, maybe 2000, 2001, something like that. So we're there, I'm, I'm with Paul, we got the truck outside and I know all the Suzuki guys because I was working there like two years before and they're like, oh, we'll go out after. Okay, so there's Ali who's Kevin's mechanic, there's Joey who was Albert's mechanic and Leroy who was I can remember Pastranas, I think, at the time. So we went to the hotel bar, drinking till like one in the morning. Then we're like, let's go to the strip club. All right. So we all go to the strip club and it's like half two, they kicked us out. Well, then Joey has the brainwave. Let's go to Tijuana. I'm in. To Mexico. Mexico. So we go, drive down to the border, left the car, walked across. And there's all like beat up old cars. They take us in. We were in just going, we got escorted out of Mexico by the police. <laughs> They took us to the border. They said, like, home time now, boys. Took all the money off us. No way. Yeah, yeah. uh, 
They, I don't think you can, no, go, no. can you just <laughs> still do that and just go out into I don't know. I used to hear them stories. I've never been to Tijuana, but when I was in America, I used to hear like, oh, people who go to Tijuana. I don't think you'd want to get on the border too much nowadays. No, I'm sure it's different now, but everything's different now. But that was a biggie. Like, say, we got in trouble down there and they literally, police, took all our money off us. Empty your pockets, boys. It's time to go. Drove us to the border and, like, watched us walk across the border. (sighs) It was that old. It was chaos. You mentioned in that last statement there, Pastrana. Did you have much to do in the like Pastrana what? industry era? I had a lot to do with Smith. Smith goggles, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he was Smith. So I used to go to his house when I had, used to travel up with Marquis when he came along. So we went to his house a few times and I used to have to go and sort all his goggles out. And Done a backflip or not? Uh, he wanted me to. I, don't know, I, <laughs> I quite value my spine, the shape of it is. I don't want to be. Yeah, because that, what year would have that been? 93? Yeah, 03. Yeah, 03. Travis was good egg. We had him on board and. He's easy. He's he was like the main Smith guy, wasn't he? At he the was time? the main guy at the time, yeah. And he was just, he was, he's exactly as he is on TV. There's no mm. pretense about him. That's what he is. He's, he's wild. In, he puts his helmet on. He goes a bit mental. There's something <laughs> about the helmet strap. I don't know what it does. He came to me with a Daytona. He says to me, You got a bottle of water on you? I'm like, oh, I'll Get one. And he's like, Okay, can you, where are you going to be stood? And I'm like, where, where do you want me to stand? And he's like, Could you stand at the end of the mechanics area? Yeah. He says, I ain't feeling too good and I think I might pass out. <laughs> and I, if you've seen the one where he was like malu- he was like manual through the whoops and it was like he was going in that consciousness doing that yeah is that not normal and he man? pulled over and I had to hold the bike he was going at a supercross <laughs> that's Daytona supercross yeah, yeah that's mental ca- I mean he, funny but he is as mental as you think and then when he came over for um, Western Beach Race the reason he came to Western Beach Race he had a trial for Subaru Pro Drive rally car people I was so, there the day before with him. Yeah, so yeah. I went. To J- Jamie Dobb took me, and he said, "Do you want to come in the car?" And I had a broken collarbone. I was fucking gutted. I couldn't get in it with him. Yeah, I the did. Subaru. Yeah, he had. They had. They had some mini cars, and the Subarus, and there was all rallying around. And for some reason, I'd met Dobby had got an invite there, and then took me there with him. And I was fuck, honestly. I think I've seen some pictures. Yeah, yeah like I got a gravel in, place. Yeah, I got, it's in Wales, Sweet Lamb. I got in the car. Was you there then as yeah, well? Yeah, I got in, and I got in the car first off. They do. Howie Vattenon, I want to say his name, was some old boy. And, like, multiple world champion, he just didn't look nothing. And they strapped me in the car, and it's in a white, no stickers on it, Subaru rally car thing. And they'd send him around to do a lap time, and that was, like, the the, the datum point, the, the standard time. And you had to be within a percentage of that, and they'd consider you for further things. So I said, do you want to go in with him? I'm like, yeah, I'll get in. I don't give a fuck. I'll have a go. So I'm sitting in there, and the thing that surprised me is your feet hurt. The stones hitting the bottom of the car hurt your feet. In the rack, because it's so that, thin. Like. They put the helmet on and all that stuff. And he's like, to look out the window, it's all chaos. It's all going off. I'm screaming like a bitch. <laughs> and you look at this, he looks like my granddad going to the shops. He's just like, properly looks like he's slow motion, this boy. And he's like, to him, it's just a drive of the park, isn't mm. it? you know what I mean? But it's all going off. I've gone mental. So then he gets out. I'm still in the car. Travis gets in. Then the mechanics come around, open the door. He's sat by where the, like, the, the wing mirrors are. He's got his feet on my chest, pulling the straps tight. And I'm like, I'm all right, I'm strapped in. He's like, no, no, this ain't a fairground. I'm like, kid, this could go proper wrong. <laughs> I'm like, fucking kidding me. And then Travis gets in, puts the helmet on, and starts talking to me. And I'm like, Ooh. I hadn't realised. My mic's all connected up. This bloke's been hearing me scream now for about five minutes. I'm just, <laughs> and I hasn't flinched, because obviously that's normal. And then me and Travis get in the car, and he goes out, and he is like screaming. And I, I, I feel for my life, it was, we nearly <laughs> went wrong. But yeah, it's something you'd done, isn't it? There was the one before Western, that was. Yeah, that's when he shit himself riding around. Yeah, well, he, and then he, well, he did the quad race, didn't he? And then he smashed himself up on the. Yeah, he had a. So they had some curry eating competition the night before, and they were eating the hottest curry, and he literally shit himself riding around. And I put his. One pants. cowboy Kenny Bartram there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bartram is there. I put his pants in the bin, and some kid got him out. Oh, <laughs> they're in the bin for a reason, dear. I've got his jersey from that race when yeah. he crashed, but yeah, uh, it, I, I have got some X Games pants as well, but they're not, they don't match. But, yeah. I got his jersey from when the number was on the side, uh, Daytona, when he did the backflip, got in trouble. Oh, yeah, because you weren't allowed, well, uh, yeah, obviously, you weren't allowed to do it. Really. What year was that then? Like three or four or something. The yellow and black and red, yeah, he come up short, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's uh, over I remember seeing it. What, um, fruitcake. You've got over, I, when I went to yours, we see there's quite a lot of um, Pastrana stuff. What's the best memorabilia you've got? Yeah, that's a now? question in here. What's the best thing you've got or the most coolest thing in there? Fuck. Like if someone was to come and steal it, what would you say you did? The want helmet to steal? Danny gave me in Vegas, which was signed by all the guys who I dealt with. 
Ah, oh, that's that was cool. kind of neat. That's kind of cool. What, I, he I went around and got it all signed for you. Yeah, and there's a miss. I got a set of Scott sheet gears. My pal had died, so that's kind of sentimental now. Yeah. Go. He's going to say there's got to be a few things in there that are quite sentimental. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got Ryan like, Villapoto stuff from the nations where he crashed. It's Which one cool. was that? Mali, I think. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Have you got pretty much something off every rider you've ever worked with? I like to try, yeah. I mean, that sounds like you're scaving, but like yourself, you know, you ask at the start of the year, and as long as you're not on every week for something. Yeah, but it's cool, isn't it? Now you can walk through there like a museum of your whole career, exactly. of what you've it's done. It's like you said, you saw them nation shirts. It's hard to get all three guys. Yeah, yeah really. That is nice. But you go into the into the weekend saying, look, I want a jersey before the end of the day, and everybody's like, yeah, no problem. Then at the end of the day, it's, it well, is Well, we was, there you was three Smith riders at the time as well. Yeah, well, I'd done well because... I only had three guys. That year? In the UK. I only had three Smith guys and all three got picked for Nations. Uh, two years on the trot. So I thought, well, I've done the right job there. Yeah, that's nice. You know, so you think... Yeah, because we don't get many... That's the year that you sprayed them up, some some proper goggles yeah, as we well. the goggles all frames. Like Tom Fuller sprayed them frames. He did a good job. That is nice. But that was a ball egg. That was like, we had to do that in like June. Because we don't get... I was going to say then, we don't get many shirts for Des Nations. I think five. Yeah. You just get one of it. One of... Um, you go out on track five times, so you get five jersey. Yeah, no, it was cool to have those, and you know, especially race worn stuff. But one yep. day, one day, I'll be gone. The kids are gonna have to fucking sell skip, them, skip it all or something. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> always be worth something. <laughs> you it? Well, you you've got the space to have it, or even now, I've got a lot of stuff from just myself. And sometimes <laughs> I do think oh, I wish I had one of everyone's designations, like that. The frame you have in the workshop with three jerseys like, does look smart. Yeah, it's just. What do you do with it all? You have yeah, that's gear what I mean. bags full of stuff, and then eventually you think, "Well, that's what I'm going to do in this room." You're going to put some jerseys up, yeah. but I have only tried to do stuff which is relevant to my career. Yeah, otherwise you'd be fucking. You'd never move. Yeah, you could have so much. It's just even for me, you put it in a box, and then after three years, you think, well, "What am I going to do with all that shit in there?" Sort yeah, of thing. I think what bothers me, I see a lot of trade in that stuff now. People buying it, and I'm like, "Why just giving it you as a?" Yeah, that winds me up as a souvenir, and then some kid turns around and sells it for three hundred. Like quid, Pokemon like, cards now. Yeah, I, I don't think that's cool. I mean, no, the I, only time it's cool is when it's auctioned for a cause. 100%. 100% that's cool. But I just don't like, there's a lot of Facebook things and people onto me all the time. Will you sell this? We sell that. No, it's a gift. Yeah. Not, no, I completely agree. So with that. That. For um, that. I, not, I don't mind a trade, though, if someone, if there's a jersey yeah. you want and you trade a jersey. Yeah, yeah. But you, you know what I mean? If you get somebody gives you something and then you just turn around and sell it. Yeah, no good. That ain't cool. No. And it's like people. I used to get it with goggles, you know, you'd give them goggles and they'd moan because the rider would sign the lens, they couldn't use them. You know, that's not what it's for, man. Mm. I mean, it's Might not well. mine anymore, it's yours now, but yeah. it does stop you wanting to... No, I see my stuff for sale and you just, I, someone's like, can you send sign this? And I'm like, I, where did you get that from? And they're like, oh, I bought it for 200 quid and I think, fucking, like, you could fair have sold play, it yeah, quid, fair yeah. play for the person that's actually spent the money on it, but because he obviously wants a jersey, but there's another guy there that sold it for 200 quid. Who's just, Stood there with his hand out, and you've given it out of the goodness yeah. of you are as a gift, as a, you know, it'll mean something to somebody. And all they see is pound signs. I think that's a bit, a bit naughty, a bit ugly, really, a bit cheeky. It's just what happens in it now. Anyway, you got any jerseys I can have? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, tight on product. Everything's getting worse, isn't it? Everything's expensive, which mm-hmm. surprising because it's not as expensive to make now with digital. Printing. No, you'd think with, they'd just smash them out. They with, can if they want. But. With digital printing and all that, is it, I think it's cheaper than it ever was. Mm. I think they're all made differently though, aren't they? Like if you if you get a sublimated jersey no, made, I it's not made by Alpine Stars, is it? Yeah, they ours actually are, but I mean I I would imagine they send it somewhere else. There's some mm. factory in France that's making all that stuff, aren't Yeah. Yeah. Um what about the Farley then? The race you've just gone, obviously you've people love that at the minute. So Good weekend. It's just, emotion, it's just emotional, trying to get ready. Everything else is on hold. All the business after Farley, after Farley, after Farley, and then the week after Farley is fucking chaos because the phone's ringing off the hook because you've told you put people off. Yeah, and trying to get ready and people supply parts and you're chasing them, chasing them, and you know, like we couldn't start the bikes up till the Monday before because we were waiting on bits. Because then suppliers are like, "Well, you've had your bits now." You're like, well, "Yeah, but we need to work on it. and We got to pack up Wednesday," and it's just chaos. And then it's great, but it's also you know, like Brownie, he's going fast and he's destroying the bike. Like last year, we couldn't keep reeds in the bike. Two races, only six lap races. He's done a set of reeds. There are only six laps. Six laps. And he's done two races. And the th- we start up to go to the third race and it's like blubbering. We're like, what's wrong with this? Well, so they're like 12 minute races. Yeah. 
I suppose because they're older boys and they don't, it's not their, they're not training. I suppose that's realistic. At least you get sprint, good racing. I think it's better sprint, than a sprint. Otherwise, if you had a 40 yeah. minute race, they'd just be sitting down cruising. But they around, do a fair few races in a weekend, don't they? Yeah. And like Brownie, like the front disc was dished. You know, like you put the disc flat on the table and the outside edge is about 10 mil up and it's like a bowl. He's heated oh, right. up that much. And that bike there is on its third front brake. Fucking hell. On the weekend. Because he's got the brakes that hot. He comes in, the wheels bind in. Because the pistons have done the seals that hot, they won't go back into the caliper. They've melted the seals. And like rear brake pads, your average AMCA kid will change a set of rear brake pads in the off-season. Three races, he's done a set of pads. There's all black dust all over the hub. You're like, I just don't think he's shutting off. I think well, he's just yeah, I guess the when you have to take fucking loads of spares of you. Yeah, it's chaos. It is hard, and everybody's looking at you. And when you're in a fishbowl and you're winning... And he pushes it off the track. You look all right, man. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh, they're only old bikes." I know, but we have to look. You know, it's yeah. event. Eventually, they is going to be a big puff of smoke, and it's going to be a problem. You know, like we had it with the Diker two years ago. He was leading and just pulled off. We hadn't run the bike in enough. And Ken, bless him, breaks stuff. That's just what Ken does. Yeah, Ken. So and he's, he's such a nice guy. And such he? a nice guy. But when he breaks something, he ain't got the ump or anything. It's just what he does. No, he don't care. It's a matter of time before he breaks it. It's just yeah. when. But Brownie's trying to break it, and we're trying to keep it together. But, but then at Farley, you've done the whole American team's bikes. Yeah. That's always what you've done at Farley. Try to, yeah. I mean, obviously we had bail and whatever, but I try to only build bikes for doers because who cares who's out there in 32nd place? Yeah. Oh, that sounds bad, but it's not doing me as a business any good. How and many you want the best people you, on your bikes. How many years have you done that for a Team America at Nations? Uh, I think maybe since 2011 or something. Oh, fuck. Fair f- so like, so nine, like last nine, 10 years. Nine or 10 years, yeah. Are you going to do it next year, someone asked? I keep saying never again. Well, you said that last year as well? I say it every year. Oh, so you do it next year then? See you there next year. You know the reason why I do it? It's because my kids love it. Oh, do they? Oh, my God. They are not interested in dirt bikes whatsoever. Don't care about nothing but Farley to them. And like Is it my, a good atmosphere then, the race and everything? It's really good. Like My wife, Claire, she loves it. She does the hospitality, so she's flat out. Um, but the kids, they get to ride around in the mule, they get to hang out with the friends. You and take I'm, the pro circuit mule? Yeah, and I'm always giving it, why do you even want to go there? And Claire said in fairness to her, you know what it is, chick? They're proud of the dad. Yeah, and that's And nice. I had a bit of a moment, I'm like, oh, God, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, because everyone's rallying around you, and they're like, that's my dad. Exactly. Uh, and I'm, She even commented on my um, Instagram before, and she put, uh, how old's your daughter? Uh, Tilly's 13, Beth's 10. Yeah, I, th- I can't remember which one it was, but I just see a comment and it just said, that's my dad. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's weird because they mm. they see me signing autographs and having pictures took with people and that, and it's... Yeah, it's quite I nice guess it's see. quite a nice family thing to do it's as well. mega. Yeah, it's a really good deal and it's busy and it's stressful, but they get to stay up late, they get to go to the slushy stand whenever they want, and then they're in the beer tent at night. Yeah, and all it's that. nice. It, it's a really, really good... And it's a nice atmosphere to and have. And they love in. it to see, the boy. they know the guys, they'll, they'll be sitting in the back of the van with Brownie, hanging out, then they'll walk out and he's getting swamped yeah. for oh, autographs, yeah, so and they're, they're like, he's like, me pal. You know <laughs> what I mean? And it is cool. It is No, that is nice. nice. I will 100% do the race. I can't wait to... Um, you should. It's a good event. It's a good event. It's, it's stressful, and I, I wonder sometimes, oh, maybe I should just go down and have a trade stand with a bike on the stand and a video running and a few, you know, some trinkets in a box and... Stand with a beer in me and then enjoy it, yeah. you know. But oh, yeah, that is true. You're always under the stress of the race, so you can't people it's hard want to enjoy, and people want to ask you about their forks or their front number plate or whatever they want to talk about. And you're busy, obviously. And I'm my priority is making sure that bike doesn't make me look like an absolute idiot, yeah. It was because he's he's pushing on and he is destroying the thing. Who done the what mechanics come in and work for the other riders? Yeah, well, Tony, who's my main guy. Yeah, Tony, he, he Tony's builds, the one who's done all our videos. Yeah, this. yeah, and he builds the bike and he works. He looks after Brownie. We get Adam Wells, who's a good little mechanic. Yeah, he looks no, after Adam. He looks after one of the guys, and Stu Summers. Oh, okay. He looks after another one. Uh, they they're great. Yeah, yeah. they're both. Really what you should do is get Stan to do it, but he's a bit too famous now. He's been on this here yeah, podcast. That's the trouble. <laughs> and then we get like Jack Bannister, who works for me. He's a good kid. And uh, he works for. Billy. He messaged asking for a pay rise. Did he? <laughs> he <laughs> said, "Ask him when I get a pay rise." <laughs> get that. <laughs> what is the etiquette at Farley in terms of like um, the t- t- the Americans pay for you to take the bikes or bring the bikes or is it I out of your pocket? On, no, I don't. I don't pay them. I just provide the bikes, but I don't get paid anything. It costs me thousands to do. And the riders get free flights. As far as I know, I don't know if they get paid. It's none of my business. Okay, so so you provide the bikes, you build them, you make them, and then it's up to you whether you sell them or do whatever you do with yeah, them after. Yeah, we don't get anything from the event whatsoever. But 
most of the bikes are sold or, or pre-sold but you like for example like rob andrews is there and he's paid 300 quid for like a 10 foot square and two passes and we've got 17 meter square and like 25 passes and all your bikes and all and like we got the mule we can drive around and so we do hey look after you at the race yeah in fairness as much as i want to bad mouth them and say i want paying but we do all right yeah i can say it's a it's a great advertising opportunity for you it is and it isn't i don't we're not advertising bike work because we've got four years why well, don't fucking advertise that for you know what i mean we can't keep up but it is good for the parts and it's good for people's brand awareness and the name but everything that's what it's all about and then people go you see there's going racing or there's going just showing up is a, here's another question then do you think that the um vlogs that we've done with tommy and building this bike is as uh oh for want of a better word because put you on the map's not right because you're already on the map but do you think it's helped definitely definitely uh, we get a lot of people start off an email i've seen the tommy so vlogs. they oh, do nice. and it's great for us and it's like parts that we didn't have six months ago we've now got yeah because it gives you a little boost like we can get them parts for this bike and let's make a few of them. Very much. Yeah, no, we've done well out of it. It's and definitely been a big thing for you, isn't it? It's the most huge. common question. When's the bike ready? When's this? The one, um, the one video I put up of a... Two okay, clips. Riding it. Two clips. It's Corner and a jump. 1.5 million views. No, it's like 1.7 million Is views it? now. Shit, Is bear. it? That's On retarded, Instagram. isn't it? That's yeah, crazy. the other... There's no other video. I mean, I've got a couple of others that have gone quite high, but one point... Yeah, 1.7, I'm pretty sure. Is it? Fucking nuts, eh? That is crazy. It's, it's cool. Um, and that keeps just getting shared. It keeps going up, up. It's only been on there three weeks. Yeah. 1.7 million. No, oh, in like Indonesia and that. It's just been shared everywhere. Yeah, you do get a lot. I mean, it's like I've noticed that, you know, like stuff that we put on used to get like a thousand likes. I was pumped now with three, four, five thousand. Yeah, it's, so I it's um, but people, I could tell when you put some something reason, on because I get like a load of follows. I'm like, <laughs> what's happened? Yeah. <laughs> it's, but a, it's the. When we was doing that bike, you said this is the bike people love. I mean, they like any bike, but that's the sort of the best of that era. Well, there's two such. stroke, and then there's Japanese two stroke because they stopped making them like 08, most of the 07s or Hondas. That was a question we had. Do you only do Japanese bikes? I don't, yeah. I, I had enough of KTMs in 88 with my really? seven. <laughs> yeah, I don't. They're good. They're good. They're so much better now than they ever were. Yeah. But I'm the 90s, aren't I? And that's what I do. You know what I mean? Like the modern stuff, fuck yeah, they're mint. Of course, they're, you know, they're really yeah, good. Yeah, great bike. They're a great bike, you know, and we deal with a lot of the top teams using them, and they are a good tool, really are. But yeah, but in that era. In the 80s and 90s, they weren't. KTM was not was terrible. They weren't good. No. Well, I don't know if I want to use that, that word, but they weren't, that, they weren't <laughs> special. Is that what Merv rode when you was working for him? Yeah, I was 87. We were on factory KTM. Well, the oh, the colour was different then, wasn't it? Like this pale orange sort of thing. Or was that just been a few it, colors. So it was years. dark red and white with bits of blue, blue hubs and stuff. And I remember we were at the R and D department and I see a blue one. I'm like, I've got a make in here and it's not, it's actually a blue kit. They were messing around with colours. Before they went orange, they didn't go orange. They they did white with a purple seat for a while, didn't they? They did like a mint green yeah. seat one time. They were proper messing around. They looked cool. But the year I was there, they were blue, white, dark red a little bit. Yeah. Now you can't miss them. It's like you've been tangoed, isn't it? No, that's, I think they look lovely. I think they're proper tall. I mean, like, you know, the amount of winning they do, you can't no. take anything away from them. You know, it's a good... Right, I reckon I've got a final question here to wrap it up, and I think it'll be quite a good one. Um, this is from Sharman, and it says, five guests that you could invite for a pint at the pub, dead or alive, who would you have? In motocross or in life? Uh, I reckon keep it motocross. motocross it's what people are watching. Let's keep it in the era. Yeah. If you name four mates, it's Carl Crest, because he was funny. Didn't give a shit. Joachim Carl Crest. Not Joachim. Haken Carl Crest. Isn't there a Joachim Carl Crest? Don't know. Haken Carl Crest is a good egg. Maybe he I've got. I've probably egg. got the wrong one. That's almost Joachim Haken. So. Yeah. See, my my heyday would be Thorpe and like Eric Gabors and all those, because they were the players. They were the doers when I was about, you know. And it's like Thorpe. It was the reason why I became a mechanic, really, because at Farley in whatever year it was he came last to first in 86 or something i stood behind keith yeah watching keith pitboard and i'm thinking i think that's a bit of me that is yeah that's nice and so you know he's the reason i took the career path i took because thorpey and like there's only two people now who ring me if my phone lights up and it's thorpey or mitch payton my ass falls out and i'm like Fucking hell, do they want? My ass <laughs> falls out when Dave calls me. As well. <laughs> he what must fuck me? What have I done now? I think he gets a lot of that. If mine rings, I think, fucking hell, what's Tommy done now? <laughs> <laughs> so you would have Carl, Carl Quist, 
Would you go for a beer with four beer or is that too... Nah, Dave's to a good now? egg, isn't he? Yeah, that's what I mean. But you could... Well, right, so yeah, Rick Johnson. Whole... Rick Johnson's a good egg. I yeah. like hanging out with RJ. Johnny O'Mara's fun. So we've got the four there. And Carmichael. 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 Carmichael's away from the racing. It's a fun yeah. boy. Oh. Even when he's come over for the yeah. them days. At the yeah, the monster stuff he come for a bit. He's a fun time. And like when I was hanging out with him, it was like mid-season, like a Loretta's and whatever, and he was like the proper player. Really? I'd never seen a kid let go like that. Really? Because well, if you if you speak to Emmett, he always used to say that bastard used to go and train while we was all trying to go and have a beer on the weekend. Uh, I don't know about that. I'm telling you now, he used to come to Loretta's in like 02, 03, 04, like mid-season, like the day after a national. And still get wild. Yeah, and they used to go and like his mechanic, his bus driver Boo used to get there. And he'd go and take people's cameras off them, take all the film out. Really? Oh, yeah, we went chaos. <laughs> we were in the beer tent one time, and there's like this little cooler trailer thing, and it was like two bucks a beer. And we were in there, and Emig, I think, Emig gave, gave me like 100 bucks. Go and get some beers in. So I'm stood at the bar, and I'm like, I just gave her the $100. She gives it, how many do you want? I'm like, how many do I get for that? So there was like 50 beers on the bar all of a sudden. And then everybody just kept giving 100 bucks. And after you've had like 18 beers, you just start throwing it around, don't you? <laughs> and then the next day, me and Scott Taylor, who was Ricky's gear guy, had to buy the DJ new equipment. Well, I guess he just wrecked it. Yeah, everything. we fucked it. Yeah, we oh, threw beer no. all over it. It was chaos, man. And then you get in golf carts and the security are chasing me. Yeah, pop on low speed chases around the pit. <laughs> low speed chases. <laughs> in golf carts, golf trying to get carts. away from security. Yeah. Chaos. It was. Loretta's, and then I crashed a golf cart with Tishner and stuff, and that kind of all spoiled it, really. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, game Well, over. maybe you don't want to take Carmichael for a beer, then he sounds like he'd get out of control. Oh, he's chaos, man. He's funny. Absolutely. Yeah, pop a egg. Of course, you load a bag the next day. Yeah, because he's golden bollocks, isn't he? He can't do anything <laughs> wrong, can he? No, so you get the blame for everything. Exactly. That's it, then. So we'll wrap that up. Yeah, cool. Well, well thanks for coming in, Bob. No, no problem. It's been a pleasure. If, you, um, if you're interested in anything that Doc Wobb's got to offer... Facebook website, what's the best one to look at? Yeah, Your Facebook and Instagram is quite... Instagram and Facebook, yeah. I need to pick it up with other people. They're like, oh, this is a new bolt we've made. I haven't done any of that. I can't be asked, But we yeah. need to. We really yeah. do need to. This is part of the business which needs picking up, really. We need to promote more of the bits and pieces we make. Yeah, so there's, there's two pages for you to look at there. If you've not watched Tommy's videos on the bike behind us here, there's three parts of building that and riding it and... That's getting left here now, Wob, isn't it? It is, yeah. So for you to uh, enjoy. Mr. Yeah. Thomas, so you've got a bit of uh, time off now. Enduro and 252 stroke. Yeah, no, I want to, um, season's over, so I want to actually just enjoy myself a bit, ride that two stroke. So I'm going to Wales next week as well. I'm going to drop my motorhome off and then ride into the hills from there, from SC motorhome. So I think I'm going to vlog that. If this is out by then, if not, I don't know, but ride a bit of enduro, a little bit of two stroke. Um, so if you've got any ideas for me vlogs, put them in the comments. And uh, Same rules apply as well. We're doing a giveaway. So thanks to Factory Image Racing, we'll be giving away a pit mat and an umbrella again. Um, so yeah, uh, drop a comment, any comment in the comment section on the YouTube channel. And in a week or two, we'll random comment selector and pick a winner. So, so thanks, thanks very much. Cheers again, Wob. Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye.